Okay. Uh, this is James Pepper, chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Uh, today is June 17th, 2021. It's currently 9.30, so I'll call this meeting to order. Um, I have a few uh, administrative details uh, to go over before we move to our agenda. Um, first, uh, the governor has lifted the emergency order, and so all the leniency that was provided to government bodies during the state of emergency um, related to the open meeting laws um, has also been lifted. Uh, we tried to secure a physical location for this meeting in order to comply with uh, the open meeting laws. Um, the logistics really just did not come together on the short notice. We don't have a physical building quite yet. Um, so starting next week, um, our plan is to continue to hold these remote meetings, but we will work with BGS to have a physical meeting location um, for whoever wants to show up, um, and we'll have uh, at least one board member present at that location. Um, so we will update our website um, as well as the Department of Libraries website with that location as soon as we have it. Second, um, while we are still technically holding special meetings. Um, we are going to be working on adopting a regular meeting schedule. That being said, um, we intend to, in the interim, um, continue to hold meetings at this time in this place um, and likely, you know, with the physical meeting location soon to be announced. Um, so Thursday is roughly 9 to 2 or 9.30 to 2. Um, for the next few weeks, um, while we're kind of waiting for our executive director to come on board and our uh, consultant, um, we're going to do some of this similar fact finding around the priorities that we've identified in Acts 164 and 62. Um, last week, we heard some very thought provoking and thoughtful testimony from small growers, business owners, um, members of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition and others about the barriers to entry um, that will prevent them um, from participating in a regulated market. This week, we're doing some initial orientation to social equity and economic empowerment. Um, next week, we are, um, we'd like to focus on the viability, long-term viability of the medical use program, including how we as a board um, can ensure access, quality, and affordability in that program. Um, we'd like to move to youth prevention and education next, um, and then probably the following week um, we'll do sustainability and energy and environmental impacts and opportunities in um, the cultivation and processing of cannabis. Um, I'd like to note uh, just uh, now that in particular to the people who have not been invited to speak to us or have more that they would like to say that all of these topics that we're talking about early on are really too important and too nuanced for a single meeting or even just a three-person board to fully grasp. Um, these initial conversations are really meant to orient us at a high level to the priorities um, of Act 164 and 62 and the concerns of stakeholders and others um, that these bills present. So our plan is to do an extensive stakeholder engagement process likely through our advisory panel and subcommittees and the rulemaking process. Um, and we'll start that kind of a little bit later in the summer once we have our executive director and consultant in place to help direct us. That being said, um, if anyone watching um, has thoughts for us or articles that we should be reading, um, witnesses that we should be hearing from, um, please continue to provide public comment. Um, you can also submit comments through our website at ccb.vermont.gov. Um, you can sign up for our press alerts and um, to the extent possible, please just continue to join our meetings, watch them um, and pass them along to anyone who might be willing to uh, lend us a helping hand or, or help guide us. So um, with those kind of just initial administrative details, I'd like to move to the agenda. Um, we um, have made one small edit to the draft minutes that were posted on our website, um, but with that change, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. 
I'll move to approve the minutes from the June 10th meeting. Great, thanks. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, okay. And now I'm gonna move just to a quick discussion of our request for services. Um, we published uh, a request for services last Friday on our website. And really what that does is details the areas of expertise and the scope of work that we feel that we need to supplement our knowledge base um, and that of our advisory committee. So very high level, very briefly, what we're looking for is someone to help us um, develop social equity programs, um, including criteria for social equity applicant, um, conduct a market analysis, um, including tax and fee projections, um, help us facilitate um, and direct our advisory committee and uh, the subcommittees that we form. Um, help us develop energy efficiency standards, ground, groundwater considerations, um, sustainability and um, kind of conservation measures. Uh, help us develop a retail framework, including specialty licenses potentially. Um, help us with some of the recommendations that we need to make around potency limits, concentrates, craft market, um, farm to consumer sales, et cetera. Um, and then services related to our uh, medical use program. So some of the initial comments that I've heard from people that are interested is this is of course a lot of work for any one consultant to tackle, uh, particularly given the budget that we have for this. Um, but it does sound like we have a few interested applicants. Um, I should note uh, that we are to the greatest extent possible gonna be relying on stakeholders and our advisory committee and the expertise that they bring to the table um, to get this job done. But we do feel like we need a consultant to help guide the process. Uh, so the application period is open. It's open until June 25th. Um, and hopefully at our July 1st meeting, um, we'll be able to select a finalist. So um, that's the RFP update. Uh, we do have next on our agenda, we're running, I guess, pretty far ahead of schedule. Unless any, does Kyle, Julie, do you wanna to add to any of this? I might just quickly say that, that James, Julie and I certainly recognize that there's a lot of potential content there for a contractor or a, um, somebody interested in working with us to come back and um, try and hit all of those bullet points that are in the suggested scope of services portion of the document, especially for the dollar figure that we're working with. But what we decided to do um, is kind of put out every kind of area that we thought, in, in addition to other resources that we have at our disposal, you know, what we feel like we could really utilize a consultant with. And we're hoping, we understand that it's gonna be hard to hit all of those points, but from a consultant's expertise, how do they best feel like they could help us recognizing that certain things, the wheel doesn't need to be reinvented for certain portions of what we're trying to accomplish, but things need to be right-sized for a state like Vermont, understanding uh, the rural nature of what we're trying to do and, and how we're trying to make sure we're we're learning lessons, both good and bad, from other states that have really, um, you know, taken a leap into a regulated market. So um, we get it. It's it's a lot to to swallow, um, and but we're excited to see what proposals do come back. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that is that, um, you know, as Kyle was saying with the and and Chair Pepper were saying about the the amount of work that's involved in this. You know, I think we recognize that we need to find some folks that can bring the national perspective and the market research to us to help complement the great information that we're getting from members of the public and people who are here in Vermont um, and are already part of this uh, process. Yeah, that's 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 absolutely right. I think you know we heard last week that we need a uniquely Vermont marketplace. And I think we need some help uh, getting there. And that's gonna be a combination of our consultant and the um, stakeholders in our advisory panel and our own kind of uh, departments of agriculture, you know, 
public service, et cetera. So um, it's going to be a collaboration, and there's certain aspects of our request for services, just like you said, Kyle, that are need to be custom to Vermont and certain aspects that I think we can look to other states and, and try and um, at least learn what they've done and, and use some of their guidance. So um, I think uh, if there's nothing more on the request for services, we'll of course have an update next week on that, but um, maybe we should uh, just take a moment to open for public comment. So we've been doing this kind of in two phases. Um, first phase would be um, anyone who's joined through the link um, could just raise their virtual hand and we'll try and go in the order that the hands are raised. And then for those folks who might be on the phone, um, to, just, to wait until I kind of open things up to people on the phone. And again, I don't see anyone on the phone, but if, if someone joins, you hit star six to unmute yourself. So if anyone um, in the who's joined through the link has a public comment, please feel free to just raise your virtual hand. I know it's a little early in the morning to get called on, but um, uh, I'll just give it a, just another minute or so. Okay, um, so I have, uh, David Templeman first, and then Graham second. So David, if you would mind just unmuting. Oop. Can you see what's going on here? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I think you may have flipped your camera, but- uh, Ah, thank you, yes. Yeah, Hi. there you go. Good morning. I just wanted to uh, take this moment to thank you all. The last meeting was uh, really uh, amazing to to have you all actually listen to other people with my own concerns and acknowledge them. And, uh, you know, coming from California, there is no forum like that. And I think we are in a very privileged and special place here to, to be able to have this conversation at all. And I, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Graham, did you want to um, unmute? A little one here who's a little upset. Hi, baby. <laughs> um, the only thing I just wanted to say, actually, why not? I'll just come back in a second public comment period right now, and I'll, I'll deal with this little lady right now. But thank you. Okay. Great. Is there uh, anyone else that would like to uh, provide a public comment at this point? And I would just uh, remind everyone that uh, what we're trying to do is to have more public comment kind of woven throughout the agenda um, so that people can respond to things that they're hearing in, in more real time than um, just kind of one public comment period at the end. And I don't see anyone on the phone, so I guess I'll, I'll skip that, but... Um, I guess uh, maybe it might be good now just to give a little primer about what we're going to be talking about today with our witnesses. Um, of course, uh, you know, when we did our walkthrough of Act 164 and Act 62 with uh, some of the lead sponsors of those of those bills, um, it was very clear, um, of course, that, uh, you know, trying to bring in as many of the small cultivators and people that are uh, currently growing into a regulated framework is one of the uh, key tent poles of the legislation. And the other one that is very explicit in um, Act 62 particularly is about social equity, economic empowerment, and trying to repair um, to the extent possible some of the harms that uh, we've seen over the past any number of decades uh, with respect to the war on drugs, selective policing, redlining, um, 
and all the kind of collateral consequences that come with criminal history records. Um, it's not, certainly I've said before, and I will say again, no amount of cannabis policy alone um, that the board can do is gonna correct uh, those kind of second, third and fourth order effects. But um, that's not to say that we, there aren't things that we can do to help uh, de-emphasize the use of criminal history records to provide tools, um, assistance, uh, capital um, to social equity applicants, people that have been disproportionately harmed, and really to kind of take a strategic think thinking on how we define social equity applicant. Um, we heard from Susanna Davis uh, um, early on, and we're going to continue to hear from her and learn from her and learn about how we can um, promote equity in all of our decision making. Um, so today, we're really going to hear, we're very fortunate uh, that um, we have such a great witness list today to hear not just about equity in Vermont from some of the people that have been fighting uh, this fight for de decades, I, I mean, specifically on cannabis policy for at least half a decade. Um, and uh, some some people that have been disproportionately impacted by criminal history records and um, have really felt the collateral consequences of those. And then also uh, from some national experts that have done some great thinking um, about um, how do you define social equity applicant? What's worked, what hasn't worked? Um, and how we can kind of embrace what I would Call on what's being well, what's being called social equity 2.0, um, and so Julie um, really put together the witness list uh, for today, um, which is just phenomenal. And I'd like to, you know, we're going to take a break, um, but I'd like to just turn things over to you, Julie, briefly, if you kind of want to give just a little bit of a primer on um, the the kind of agenda for today. Sure, I think um, it. it it's worth pointing out that President Nixon announced the war on drugs 50 years ago today. So perhaps it's apropos that we're having this discussion today and it's taken 50 years to get to this point where we're, you know, looking at reducing those harms in earnest, both at a state uh, and local level and at a national level. So in, in terms of building the witness list today, um, you know, as Chair Pepper said, we have reached out to some folks who are local who have experience personal experience to share in the criminal justice system and how it's impacted their lives. Um, and then also um, one person who did quite a bit of um, advocacy work in the legislature for the social equity programs that um, we'll be building. And then later in the afternoon, we have some folks who've done some national work that um, can share with us some lesson learned, lessons learned in other states. Um, and the, the idea behind this is it's, you know, the very beginning of a much longer conversation of things that will, you know, equity will touch every piece of, you know, this legislation and every piece of the rules and program that we build. So um, this is the first of many conversations and we tried to bring in a variety of voices and we'll continue to do that. That's great. Um, thank you for that and the historical perspective as well. Kyle, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, you know, we can get in touch with Mark and see if maybe he's willing to join us a little bit early. Um, Nelly, maybe you could maybe you could do that. Um, but uh, is there anything you'd like to add before we take a kind of brief break and uh, get ready for our witnesses? Um, I think I think you both covered it. I think <clears throat> it's it's going to be an, a very important discussion today. I'm excited to to hear from folks from a different couple of perspectives in the state of Vermont. Those that have been fighting this fight, those that have had previous uh, convictions for marijuana related um, issues in their past and um, hearing nationally how, you know, how some states and advocacy groups have really uh, tried to make social equity front and center to a lot of these programs and, and the, the shortcomings associated with that. Um, uh, Chair Pepper, I did see Graham's hand go back up during your remarks. I don't know if he tried or if, if uh, his daughter may have afforded him the ability to provide a comment, but I know we're in this little waiting game. Um, it might be appropriate to see if, if Graham is, I don't want to put Graham on the spot, um, 
if he still has a comment and, and he's in a position to to be heard, um, I would suggest sure. that we listen to him. Graham, if this is a good time to chime in, please, or if anyone else would like to provide some public comment, please uh, feel free to raise your virtual hand. Uh, sure, thank you. This is Graham, the policy director from rural Vermont. And um, I didn't want to distract from the focus of the meeting today on racial equity, but um, given that we were just at the beginning, you were speaking about the RFP and some of the other stuff. I wanted to specifically speak, I was looking at the description to the RFP and I understand that it's sort of written within the bounds that you all were given, you know, under, in terms of from statute. It refers to, for example, the the zoning issues we spoke to last week and how you're sort of confined to to um, cannabis being considered commercially zoned. Um, you mentioned the current use allowance of a thousand square feet. I guess I would just encourage you, knowing that you also have the ability to make recommendations to legislature to change statute, to perhaps you know make that RFP a little more broad. Um, such that it, it could, for example, um, analyze the access and affordability differences between commercially zoned land and agricultural or residential land zoning, um, et cetera, et cetera, such that you have the information to, to make reasonable um, recommendations to the board beyond what um, that could, could, could push back against some of the things that are in statute, which may serve as significant equity barriers um, whether from an economic perspective or from a racial perspective. So that's my, my comment before we really get into the, the racial equity piece here. But thank you all very much. Yeah, yeah. and if, if I may quickly um, respond to Graham, thank you. Uh, certainly appreciate that. If you kind of, I've been working in the RFP world, um, unfortunately or, or fortunately, I guess the way you you know, want to look at it um, in drafting these things and, and selecting contractors and going ironing out a statement of work. Um, you know, there's a couple of different phases where you have an opportunity to really drill into what the specifics are going to be that a, a contractor would service us with. So there's, you know, there's it, that, as you outlined, Graham, is not in a in the suggested scope of work. And perhaps that was in we overlooked or I overlooked that in, in taking a stab at drafting this. But if it's something that we feel is is important, we can certainly make up for it um, through uh, a more detailed statement of work once a contractor is selected. So thank you. Any other uh, public comments from anyone in the audience? Okay. Well, um, why don't we take a break? Uh, we're scheduled to come back at 1020. Um, I, I think I might be able to get Mark to join us a little bit early, but uh, if if not, um, we'll come back at 1020. Um, but uh, otherwise, um, we'll just kind of stick to our agenda as it is. So thank you, Nelly. Could you um, just throw up our away message and uh, maybe just pause the recording for us? So Mark, I just, I know you're there. If you're if you're ready, I would just like to just say a few introductory remarks about you, if you don't mind. I don't want to embarrass you. Here, uh, and I'm I'm just still trying to get things figured out here. But by the time you get finished, I should be okay. I'm I'm actually in a shared space, and I'm trying to figure some things out. But I am I am prepared. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, um, this is. Uh, Mark Hughes' first time in front of the Cannabis Control Board, um, which is, uh, we're very fortunate to have him here. Mark is the co-founder of Justice for All. Um, he's a member of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. He's the original co-chair of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Advisory Panel. Um, he's been fighting uh, what I would consider a great kind of emotional cost for equity um, not just on in cannabis policy, but across all social systems for as long as I've known him. Um, he's been a seminal voice uh, on my understanding of systemic racism and white supremacy. And I think despite some of the shortcomings of Act 164 and Act 62, um, there was a reorientation of those two bills uh, away from some of the purely public safety um, or consumer safety priorities to a more social equity focus uh, that likely would not have happened without Mark's consistent advocacy. 
And that really is not meant to de-emphasize all of the voices that were calling for change. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge uh, some of Mark's contributions. Um, Julie, uh, again, you put together the witness list for today. So I'm going to hand things over to you um, to, to manage. Um, and But uh, just really grateful for Mark to be here today. And um, I'll turn things over to you, Julie. Sure. It looks like Mark is still getting a little set up. Um, so just to kind of reiterate, there was, you know, Acts 164 uh, didn't fully address social equity. And then Acts 62 um, has really four or five points that are specific to social equity around fees, um, around reporting back to the legislature, um, and a few other things. So are you ready, Mark? You're muted. Sorry about that. That's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. I'm going to start without video, and I'll come back. So I just want to thank, because just in the interest of time, I want to keep things moving for everybody. Okay. Sure. Um, so, so thank. I want to thank the um, the uh, the board itself. You know, for um, you know the way the manner in which you've come together and the sense of urgency. Uh, to the extent that you have uh, been able to uh, move forward. Um, I also want to just give like a shout out to just the, uh, just all of the folks that are behind the scene that a lot of folks don't see that are doing this work. And I, I know it's really super exciting for a lot of folks across the state. And I know sometimes what it seems like is, is that there's like a fly in the ointment and you got folks that are trying to slow things down or um, maybe they don't appreciate uh, the uh, the magnitude of what it is that's actually happening because perhaps they haven't been around in this uh, space. I know uh, Chair Pepper has been around, has been uh, has had some uh, you know extensive experience in this space over the years. As some of the others, I know I've seen a lot of folks who come and testify. Uh, also, um, and I know that this is sensitive because it's about money, and when when folks start talking about money, everybody gets crazy. So I just wanted to um, <clears throat> just, you know, especially shout out to the, uh, each one of the board members whom I've actually had the opportunity to speak with uh, offline. I uh, appreciate that. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to do was is just acknowledge the legislature as well, <clears throat> which is, you know, it hasn't been, you know, a, a, it's been a pretty bumpy road with the legislature. Uh, and uh, every, you know, there's no denying that and I, and I know, uh, that all of them, you know, whether it's Dick Sears or Jeanette White or Dick or John Gannon or uh, uh, Sarah Copenhagen or whoever it is we're talking about, I'm sure that they would agree that this has been a bumpy ride and uh, we haven't always agreed. And, and I still don't agree uh, with uh, some of the things that we came to conclusions on. Um, so, but at the same time, <clears throat> I respect the time and effort that they put into it. And the engagement with them was formidable, and I, I do appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I'm the executive director of the of the racial equity, uh, the Racial Justice Foundation, but I'm also I'm also a um, the founder and the principal of the Racial Equity Association, which is a DEI consulting firm. I, I didn't have enough things to do, so I figured out I'd do some other stuff, um, and also. Um, what I've started to do in my off time is, is I figured I would go ahead and start a cannabis company, and it's it's called uh, it's called uh, the uh, Cannabis uh, Partners, Vermont Cannabis Partners. It's it's a company in name only, but I believe in full transparency uh, in the work that I'm doing, and I think it's important that uh, you know before this body that that type of information is available. I think I found some power and I'm, I'm, I can show myself now. Um, you have no idea just what it takes to get to make these things happen in the background. Um, 
I want to, I just want to offer a few words and, and before I check in, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I also wanted to just, um, first, I wanted to verify, uh, first of all, has the, I get the sense that there is an executive director of this body. We uh, announced last last meeting that we're going to be hiring Bryn Hare as our executive director. Okay, okay. So I just I I thought I heard a rumor or something like that. So I, I didn't want to move too far into the um, into the conversation without acknowledging uh, Bryn Hare, who I know and deeply respect. Uh, and who has been uh, instrumental in uh, much of the work that we brought to the table, not just in the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel work in Act uh, 54 in 2017, uh, but was also uh, present and, and available in, in much of the other work that we're doing, that we've been doing. And I'm sure if we haven't seen her on the forefront in the committees, that she's definitely been busy uh, down there in the dungeon. Uh, so I know that there's um, there's a lot of work that she's put into this, and I think and I really appreciate and respect that um, you know that 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 Brent is being offered the opportunity to, to have the gig, and so that's that's just great news. Uh, so congratulations, um, uh, Director Hare. Thank um, you. <clears throat> I, I wanted to just um, tell you like the perspective that I'm going to be speaking from because. Um, more than anything, I wanted to talk from the perspective of the Vermont, uh, the um, the uh, Cannabis Equity Coalition, and stand shoulder to shoulder with my colleagues that have already come before you. I know that they've um, already um, kind of glazed over, or I should say glanced over some of the stuff related to uh, racial equity in particular. Uh, I know that uh, some of us have uh, various all members of the board have had conversations with us collectively and or me individually about uh, matters concerning equity. I know that you have all uh, had the opportunity to review H414, which was our proposal for racial equity uh, in the policy. Um, and I think that it's, it's safe to say that um, there was an attempt uh, by the legislature to incorporate some aspect of what it is uh, that we were doing. Um, I think it would be, it would, um, I think it would be robbery if I didn't, you know, speak on um, racial equity in the cannabis industry from a broader perspective and, and really talk about some of the broader work that we're doing. So here's what I'm going to do is, is I want to talk um, just a little bit more broadly, and then I want to circle, come back in and, and talk about equity. Uh, here in this particular market, um, from the perspective of the, you know, this is the, um, it, within the context of our coalition, the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, but however, um, I, I do want to speak specifically, for, you know, as the executive director of the Racial Justice Alliance from that context, then, then what I'd like to do is to stop for a minute and take my hat off and, and tell you kind of how I'm feeling uh, as a guy who's, um, you know, who's, Looking at potentially entering this market, um, a, a you know, an African American man here in 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 Vermont who has, in name only, registered with the Secretary of State, and that is all, uh, and is looking at this market and saying, "Well, this is a this looks like a good opportunity. What do I do now? Uh, I don't know what to do." Um, so, from from the broader perspective, before I go on. Um, I'm noting the time right now that it is 1030. And uh, I, I, I believe that uh, I was uh, scheduled to speak for about 30 minutes. Um, but I, I want to just do a quick check in on that. And because I do not need to go for 30 minutes, but I could go for the next two hours. Uh, so, <laughs> so I just want to check with, uh, with, uh, with uh, you, Julie, on that. Yeah, so I think you have a little bit of time, Mark. We did have one witness um, that was supposed to appear between you and the, the next witness that wasn't able to make it. And we've asked the other ones if they can come a little early, although I do not see them yet in the meeting. So I think um, I think you can probably plan to talk for a little bit. Okay, I appreciate that. And just so you don't get dizzy, I'll just tell you, I'm going to just turn around a little bit because this, this is a shared space. And just in, in the event that somebody else joins us, I don't, I want to just respect their, 
privacy if they walk in the, the building. So thank you for that. And I, I would just assume that we'll, we may be okay until maybe about 11 or something like that. If, and I, I would, what I'd like to do is in the, you know, is, is instead of talking at you for the next 30 minutes, I would love to have a conversation with the, with the board. Uh, I'd love to hear from you um, and, and answer any questions and, and perhaps just more importantly, walk away better understanding your, your perspectives. Um, so I can, you know, because I, I think part of part of this is is I view it as a conversation and also view it as a an opportunity for me to learn, um, and that'll be something that um, will be um, kind of a recurring theme in this entire conversation on cannabis because I think that's what a lot of people are looking for. This is an opportunity to learn, um, and I think uh, you know with that, um, you know, obviously you're going to hear. You're gonna hear. Um, you're gonna hear that there's a lot of folks that just don't have access to capital. Uh, you're gonna hear that a lot of folks um, <laughs> don't have access to land. Um, but I just wanted to flag that you, you're also gonna hear that there's a knowledge deficit, that the infrastructure is just doesn't exist to be able to ramp folks up uh, at the warp speed um, that this is uh, moving at. Um, to ramp folks who are disproportionately impacted up to really to get proper footing so they can walk in pace with uh, what's going on so they can have the same types of opportunities. So we'll talk more about that before. Before I talk about that, though, what I would share with you, though, is, is that um, we've, you know, there are, there's some significant challenges uh, that we are, um, that we're, that we're facing as, as a state, as a, per, you know, and as a country, you know, as it pertains to, uh, this whole idea of uh, racial inequities. Um, for those who have not noticed, uh, now uh, in the wake of a global pandemic which laid bare um, these disparities across all determinants, all social determinants, uh, uh, and has impacted black and brown people first and worst uh, across um, just all, all of these um, areas, then for those who did not notice, then I'm not talking to you uh, because this is, a, this is another conversation and I don't know that you have the capacity to actually uh, hear what I'm trying to tell you. But for those who did notice um, what has been occurring here over the last um, 15 months uh, and indeed uh, 402 years, uh, is is that there is a there is a disparity that exists uh, that's being produced by this thing that we call and some ignore uh, systemic racism, and I think that um, that's the frame that I, I come to the conversation with. Now I qualify what I'm some of the things I'm going to say is because I cannot speak um, I cannot speak um, emphatically or um, uh, in a very well-informed manner about all of the things being marijuana. Um, I, all of the things being, and if you find that term um, offensive, then think about why. Um, but all of these things, I don't, I, I, don't, I, can, I don't have the ability to effectively speak towards uh, constructing a market or have the ability to speak towards all of the ins and outs. Um, and there's a reason why. Um, and, and I think that many folks who are black and brown uh, could probably say the same thing. But what I can tell you about is, is I can tell you about systemic racism and how um, in, in some way or another, uh, it would seem to me as if the, an emerging market like this um, would be uh, impacted. Um, it would be impacted. Um, I, think, um, I think the best, best, best place to start is, is just where uh, Chair, Chair uh, uh, Pepper started was is uh, just talking about some of the work that we we've uh, been working in because the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel that was created. Uh, what also came out of that panel was the attorney generals and the human rights commissions task force uh, that provided um, a report on uh, disparities across all systems of uh, state government. Uh, and what does that mean? What it what it really means is 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 that simply 
the Attorney General, uh, T.J. Donovan at the time, and, and, and the Human Rights Commission Executive Director, Karen White at the time, uh, produced a report. I think David Schur actually ran and carried the water. But there was a report that was produced that just you know, laid it out, laid it bare, and, and, and talked about the, all of the impacts. Um, it, and it talked about the need for this, this state to, to, to lean in and actually take this kind of work seriously. Uh, so that's where, that's what created the impetus for us to come back the following year with S-281, and then Senator Debbie Ingram introduced S-281, and through that, um, through one veto and a return in the special session, uh, we were able to bring across the finish line a uh, policy that would create the position of the racial equity executive director. Though we did uh, feel that the executive director should have been an independent position, and we still do, uh, we also feel that uh, there should be some some um, uh, obligatory and compelling language in that Title III that actually uh, causes state agencies, that actually obliges state agents to adhere to data collection policy and training, but that's another conversation. We also thought that maybe there should have been, I don't know, maybe about $5 million or so to create a data infrastructure to support the the disaggregated racially data across racial data across all state systems instead of kicking the can down the road uh, on data that's just related to the criminal justice system. All of this is related. The reason why it's related is, is because we've been doing the work. Yes, H210 came over the finish line, which is the health equity bill. Uh, the economic uh, empowerment bill did not. The home and land ownership bill did not. So there's a lot of things that didn't happen, things that are crucially important. Uh, we, we also don't feel that we've made significant progress uh, with, with this policy here, with this, um, with this, um, with this um, cannabis equity policy. Um, I think the, the relationship here is, is that there is, there, you know, there is, there is a severe disconnect in, um, you know, in, you know, this whole idea of, you know, what does economic opportunity look like for black and brown folks? In fact, what I would share with you is, is that indeed, the median wealth of, of, of a black family is one thirteenth that of a white family, and, and that's that's pre-COVID, and, and that was it, that was growing at that time. Um, these, I think, I think all of these facts are relevant uh, when we start talking about considering rules. Um, when we start talking about considering how we, I, we full, I fully ex expect that our our coalition will be going back uh, to the um, to the legislature. Uh, I think that they were largely uh, leaning on you to take the lead in, in the creation of some of these rules. I think definitely definitions, uh, when it comes to definitions, uh, as it pertains to, um, you know, those, all those things concerning, um, you know, those who are disproportionately impacted, definitions concerning, um, you know, what these, you know, you know, how do we define us? Uh, the uh, the challenge that we're trying to address, uh, I you know it was disappointing. It was highly frustrating that you know I feel as I was talked in a circle in uh, in uh, you know in in the legislature. I think largely in judiciary, probably in uh, gov ops and senate. You know because you know somehow or another there's uh, this um, sense of amnesia uh, that has occurred uh, in some of our legislators who seem to have forgotten. Uh, how um, this nation has gotten on its economic footing and how it is, how it could be that, you know, in terms of race and class, that most black people are poor, uh, despite the fact that most poor people are white. Uh, and the fact that the, um, this was created uh, by policy of this nation, uh, by, by, by federal policy and by state policy of this nation, is the reason why these disparities exist today. The reason why 39.4%, um, uh, 39.4K is the median household income for black folks in Vermont, while 50, while 63.7K uh, is the median household income for white folks in Vermont, which is why the unemployment rate for black folks is at 4.4, while that for whites is 3.5, which is why today 25.9% uh, of Vermont black population is at below the poverty line. What I said is uh, over a quarter of black folks in Vermont, um, they live below the poverty line, whereas 
um, what we see is, is that number is around 10% for white people. And we know that 24.4% of black Vermont homeowners, there are 24% of, of blacks who own homes in Vermont, whereas 72%, nearly three quarters of the homeowners in Vermont, of whites in Vermont own homes. And this is significant, not to say that any of uh, these, these other things that I was saying is not, but whereas despite the fact I beg your pardon, whereas 0.2%, whereas 0.2% of Vermont farms are owned by blacks, 0.2% of Vermont farms are owned by blacks, and 99.7 are owned uh, by whites. 52.7% of black are, are, vi- are vaccinated, where 61%, 61.5 are vaccinated. 37.5% um, of Vermont um, third graders are um, proficient. They are proficient in the English language, where, where over half of the whites are. And the list goes on and on. Um, and so the question is, is not so much, um, is this a coincidence or is this, you know, how could it be that all these things go together? The question is, is, you know, how do we connect this to our, and contextualize this to, to the, to our historical context of who we are as a state and who we are as a nation. Now, some would say that what I came to do is, is to give you some critical race theory or something like that. Um, but you know, I think, um, Really, what I came what I came to do is is to connect the true history of who we are as a nation and who we are as a state to the empirical data that lays before us in the context of an emerging market, and ask you to take that into consideration as we're creating these rules, and as we're creating this structure, and as we're grounding everything and centering everything that you do as a, a, as a as a board. That's all I really came to ask you. I could leave now. I mean, that's pretty much what I just came to ask you. Um, and because I, I do believe that in, inherently, the manner in which this this whole contraption has been contrived up until this point has been informed by the very mess that I'm telling you about right now. Okay, and I have zero confidence in the current trajectory of it. I don't current. I don't mind telling you that unless something changes in the decision making process. It, it processes in terms of how this thing is rolled out. Now you can decide to just do the same old thing and you'll probably be held accountable very little because those who, who stand to profit are, are largely already affluent white men because that's, if you look across the nation, that how, that's how it's already proven itself to be. Um, and we don't really have the political power to necessarily hold you accountable in numbers or in power, not, not, not so much. Um, I think I think there are some of you who would care to be on the right side of history, and I think there, are, despite what many others might say, I think there is a a strong moral compass that's on this 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 pan, this board um, to include the recently appointed director. Uh, so w- what I'd like to do is is um, you know share with you just some thoughts, some brief thoughts uh, from you know the perspective of the alliance uh, and the co- the coalition rather. Uh, you know, grounded in some of the work that the Alliance has done. And just so you know, 414, what you would have saw in 414 is the vast majority, uh, a a lot of the same language, some of it has emerged transparently, but a lot of the language that you've seen from my ag colleagues, Maddie and Graham, uh, Josh, uh, Jeffrey, a lot of the language that you've seen from my colleagues would have been in H414. I'm not going to get into the politics and the procedural um, jockeying and maneuvering that pre- precluded that from occurring, but you could only imagine being close to and in and out of the state house how these things have a tendency of working themselves out. And it probably would also explain why this thing is still on the wall in GovOps and was hardly even ta- in House GovOps and was hardly even taken into consideration when S25 uh, arrived. In, in fact, it wasn't. Um, I did want to. Um, 
take a couple minutes and, and just step through H414, not in detail at all. There's a few things, there was four major points that I saw in 414 that I wanted to bring to your attention really quickly. One is there's a lot of, there's a lot of time spent on definition. Um, if you were to go over on page five of 20, you see things like social equity applicants. Um, uh, four of 20 qualified social equity applicants. The legislature did not, did not have a political will or the intestinal fortitude. They call it time. Uh, they said they didn't have the time to actually get this done. Uh, so they kicked it to you. Uh, so I wonder uh, if we might be able to have some, and, and I'm, I'm leading all of this to somewhere, and I, let me just tell you where it's going just in case you cut me off, is, is that um, you know, I really believe that there, there should be some type of racial equity or social equity um, a standing advisory committee to the work that you're doing. In fact, it might even, you may even uh, need, I, I think in order to truly guide the work that you're doing effectively, that you may even, you may even have some kind of director or something like that, or, or someone who has sole responsibility for keeping their eye on the ball with this thing. Because for some odd reason, every time we start talking about money, everybody gets all goofy and they take their eye, their eye off of the ball and everything goes sideways. And then by the time we know it, the same people end up getting rich, by golly. I don't know why that keeps happening. Um, and I think that, you know, if we're going to really have, you know, roll this thing out with an eye on equity, again, we should roll every market out with an eye on equity. Okay, I think the, the significance of this market is, is the harm that this weed has done. Uh, and, and, it, and, it's, and when you think about the harm, I need you to think generational harm. Because so long, uh, throughout this process, I've had white people looking at me saying, well, did you go to jail? Or did, well, who went to jail? Well, did they get out of jail? Do you understand what it means when a person in your family is incarcerated and how that affects generationally, folks? And not just that person or that family, but when you have a large demographic of folks in a certain, when you have a large group of folks in a certain demographic population, how that even impacts who they are? The damage, um, please note the Kerner report, if you will, you know, in terms of the fact that this is not a black problem, this is a white problem. Because, you know, systems of oppression have been using the criminal justice system to oppress black people since whenever. So I wanted, so I just wanted to just urge you that, you know, um, when you start talking about creating process in the work that you're doing, then hold yourself accountable and put somebody in place to kind of oversee that. Susanna Davis is not that person. Why? Uh, the reason why is because she's a political appointee. She works for the governor. Yeah, she's got some great ideas. She's got some great intestinal fortitude, eloquent and a great friend, but still a political appointee who works for the governor. And she does not speak for our community. She probably is consistent with some of the things that we believe, but just because she's a black face and she has that name, don't pull her in your committees and say, Susanna said, we can do it. So we're, we're heading down that road, especially because that's just what you want to do anyway, like the legislators often do. So um, I'm going to pause there for a minute and then I'll go through those other three things I wanted to tell you. I already told you where I was taking you, yeah. um, but there was like three, there were, there were four things about 414 that I wanted to share with you. And then I'll, I'll sing you a sad song about the company that I'm trying to start. Uh, is there, are there any questions or, or comments mm -hmm. so far? So I have a couple of questions, Mark, Chair Pepper, if it's okay if I just start. Absolutely. Um, and I just lost my train of thought. Oh, so one of the things that we've talked about or talked about in one of our first meetings was a subcommittee of the advisory committee and our committee that would look at racial equity. So that's one piece that maybe doesn't fully achieve your goal of a um, – you know, of a, a, a racial equity committee or advisory committee, but is, is, you know, sort of along the same lines in the same thought process. So that's one um, thing I wanted to mention. And then I had a question about, in 414, um, it talks about, uh, you all recommended a um, definition for social equity applicant. And one of those uh, pieces of that definition is the 51% ownership. But what I understand is that in some states, there has been, um, you know, companies that come in in a predatory nature and try to convince someone to um, be that 51% ownership or to sign on to something. So I, 
I want to know how to prevent that in Vermont or what your thoughts are about that happening in other states um, and taking advantage of people um, in order to get that social equity applicant designation, um, but really in, in it's predatory and taking advantage of people. Can you talk to that a little bit? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I, the short story is I don't have the I, I don't have the answers to that, um, but but uh, you know it does occur to me that it's not unlike um, you know challenges or issues that have existed in other markets or in other situations. I, I don't think we need to. I don't think we're like making this new wheel um, to that extent. Um, there are plenty of markets where um, there are plenty of situations to where there's um, you know as, as far as control. Uh, we're because really what we're talking about at the basics of this conversation is control of a company uh, and trying to demonstrate that there is a person that has a vested interest in a community or a state or whatever uh, to uh, to prove that control. Uh, and, you know, obviously that may go into residency that may go into, you know, there, there's a lot of different directions that could go. It could be time, you know, how how long have you can you prove, you know, who's the agent? There's there's I could take that. Um, and run with it, but I won't uh, because I think that, um, you know, respectfully, I just think that, you know, that's that's the low hang, that's the easy ones. Th those are the easy ones, in, in my personal opinion, frankly. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I, I think I, I would be more than happy to, um, you know, return to that conversation with you at some point when it seems appropriate. Uh, but uh, I do believe that you know that's low hanging fruit, and and we can we can get after it. Okay. Mark, I've got a uh, I got a question for you, but it's not related to H four fourteen. Um, it's more, I'm just noting the time, and and uh, I just want to make sure I hear from you on some of these more foundational questions. Um, uh, what? How should we as a board define success when it comes to social equity and economic empowerment? I mean, is it just, you know, we've been given our authority. We have this limited authority. Should we define success as a board just as cannabis license ownership? Or is there something else that we can look to, um, you know, given our authority and to kind of achieve those promises of social equity and economic empowerment? Yeah. Yeah. I think we should define success together. I think yeah. that's how we should define success. Um, I think that um, I think that there are, there are you know folks folks who are representative. You know, and I don't I don't speak for all black and brown folks in the community uh, in the, in this who are leaning leaning into this um, market or who who are interested in this market. I'm sure there's some who will probably diametrically oppose me on some of the things that I'm saying today, and that's okay um, because they need to be heard as well. But we do, however we define this, we need to do it together. Uh, and I think that that means that the board shouldn't do it by themselves. And that means that they shouldn't just put the weight on the community, the black and brown and poor community uh, to do so either. Uh, so I, I, but I do think that those 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 um, goals or those, um, you know, those, those success, those key performance indicators along the way or whatever all of that looks like, I do believe that they would be emerging. Uh, I think that what we're doing is overwhelming. Uh, I think that, you know, we have to, I, I do believe we need to take some baby steps. And right now we're running at a full sprint. Um, you know, I just, I just want to flag the fact that, you know, when, when things are important to folks with political and economic power, especially those who are affluent, who have control in everything, there is a sense of urgency. Uh, but when things are important to black and brown and poor people who have a sense of urgency to achieve some type of economic goal or something like that, then those with uh, political and economic power have a tendency to slow things down. Right now, what it looks like that things are on full tilt, uh, running real fast, uh, and I think you know this, Pepper, because we've talked uh, uh, personally, uh, is is that you know so, these and some other questions. I hope we get a chance to slow some things down and talk about. Um, you know, we know we can't, we don't want to delay going to market because that's just not, that's not even. I, I would be dumb to show up talking like that. But somehow or another, we got to figure out how we get our heads around some of this stuff surrounding equity. I hope that answers your question. It, it does, and it also s addresses my follow-up question as well about, you know, when you move quickly, when we as a three-member board, you know, all-white board move quickly, we unfortunately have to rely on our mental shortcuts, aka our unconscious biases. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I talked, we talked to Susanna Davis when she was here um, a few weeks ago about how we can try and 
short circuit those and not entrench them in our rules, in our um, application processes. And, um, you know, there's no great answer, of course, but uh, I think, you know, it, it weighs on me pretty heavily about this kind of Nate, the kind of what you described, the, the desire to move quickly versus the desire to not entrench some of uh, the kind of systemic biases that we've seen in our work, especially early on. And that's not really a question, but uh, I'll turn things over to, uh, I'll turn things back over to Julie. Can I ask one question? Mark, thanks so much for <clears throat> for being here. I wanted to get back to- I was wondering where uh, you were. <laughs> oh, I'm here, don't worry. Um, I wanted to get back to some of the, the, the great data that you provided us a little bit ago. And I say great because it's quantitative and not anecdotal because uh, the disproportionate nature of it and is, is certainly disheartening. Um, so I don't want you to think that I think that the actual numbers are great. Um, you mentioned a uh, two point, and I want to make sure I got this clear, a 0.2% of Vermont land are owned by uh, uh, people of color or black people. And 97 or 99.7% is owned by white people. Percent. Was it land? What that means is that's percent of Vermont farms. Okay, farms, because I wanted to, uh, I was wondering if it was all, all types of zoned land in the state, whether that's residential, commercial, zoned for agricultural use. Um, and I'm, and obviously this is a, I know we're running short on time and I don't want to belabor uh, certain points as we try and crack this commercial versus agricultural conundrum and nut for um, a lot of small cultivators, at least in the state. You know, I'm wondering about barriers to entry and, and buying agricultural use land for people of color versus commercial, you know, buying commercial businesses or commercial land for folks and people of um, folks of color and um, where we kind of shake out what what uh, I, I, I want to be conscientious of that as we try and potentially make recommendations to the legislature around the agricultural versus commercial, you know, concept. And so if you have any kind of more um, data that I can sink my teeth into as we start to think about how to go about addressing some of those issues, that would be very helpful. Absolutely. It's good to see you. And uh, that, 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 those data are noted on our website. If you go out to our website under data, that's vtracialjusticealliance.org, go under data tab. Uh, cruise down there where you find that stat and you'll find a link out to 2017 Census of agri uh, Agriculture. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Agricultural Agricultural. Uh, so that you can unpack that data there Regar regarding your second point or the the um, I guess the extension of your comment uh, surrounding um, you know commercial what we know about commercial land is just more expensive uh, what we know uh, you know about wealth is is it's, it's passed down through housing and land some of these things that you know we've got you know we've got the you know empirical data some of these things you know we have to uh, make certain assumptions and in fact it not only would be un, unwise, but it, it would be almost um, it would be almost hypocritical. It would be almost um, derelict for us to not make certain conclusions in the absence of some of this da these data. Um, you know, it's kind of like saying, well, um, systemic racism, it exists everywhere except for here, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous. Because by definition, if it exists anywhere, it exists everywhere. So we do. So we do have to make certain assumptions. However, it's not necessary that we make bold assumptions. Um, what we do know is, is when we start talking about poverty rates, that those data are, those data are available. And we start talking about wealth rates, those data are available. It doesn't take a leap of logic to understand the trans, the uh, intergenerational wealth, uh, and and where that landed along racial lines. Um, so I think that, you know, what we're unpacking here is, is yes, we're unpacking a, a problem that was that was related to cannabis, uh, but this it's a much broader challenge. And we, it's not that we need to fix everything with this market, but we certainly want to acknowledge everything as we roll this market out, acknowledge its impact. To not do so is somehow or another to suggest that we can just look at where we are today 
and forget about everything all the way back to 1865 or 1619 for that matter and not try to and, and not reconcile we're, what we're doing today with the historical context in which we exist this is this is the challenge of rolling this market out okay and and to to do so again i'll say again it's derelict um three 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 additional points i hope well before i go on does that help that certainly helps. Thank you. I'm very familiar with the with the ag census, and I think all of this data is going to be important. Obviously, no matter where a, a person of color chooses to en enter this marketplace, whether it's as a, a grower where the ag versus commercial question will really be um, something I want to pay close attention to, but there's other opportunities in more of the strictly commercial context for a person of color to enter this marketplace, we hope, and recognizing the balance with which we're working in, I just want to make sure we understand barriers and how we can work to address such barriers, you know, depending on on the, the tools that we have. So thank you. Yeah, it looks like my time is about up, but I, I will just, um, you know, there's a there's a maybe a couple of high level points I can hit on the way out the door is, is in 414, um, you know, we were we were definitely looking at definitions. Uh, one of the things that that we were looking at was is um, you know what does you know what is this uh, this whole business of and and this is one of the things that we were uh, looking at in in S25 the complement 124 uh, was the cannabis equity programs uh, we know that um, the cannabis uh, development fund is is one of the things that did actually stick um, we don't know how that program is going to be funded beyond the first year. Um, I, I don't know if you know. I, I mean, I'd love to hear it. Um, it, you know. So there's that, and then of course, um, the third, the third thing we were looking. The other thing was is um, a community social equity program, and that was something that was completely taken off the uh, table. We won't uh, really go uh, too much into that. And then, um, then finally, when we started looking at integration, integrated licenses, uh, you know, and how we were would be able to rely on the integrated licenses to be able to, to, to do some really innovative and creative things and five really. One uh, was is to, um, to further fund the program. Uh, that's the social equity program. Two was to offer education because again, you know, give me land, give me money, but if I don't know anything, where am I going? Uh, what do I mean by education? That is the, you know, fund the Vermont Community College, get a program up, get some folks in there. Um, Reentry uh, is the third one. Uh, an incubator space incentivizing uh, the, these integrated businesses to create their own incubator space to be able to turn folks out into the market, even allow them to get up to 10% um, uh, on a stake in that business as they turn it out. And then the last one is the loan program that allow businesses to 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 loan money uh, to um, to loan money to uh, uh, upcoming those thriving businesses those uh, reaching back and pulling forward those businesses that were up and coming so essentially that was that was 414 in my estimation you know with the richness in you know and as well as the um thoroughness of what that policy was seeking to achieve as opposed to what we actually received you know i think it's like more like night and day uh, hopefully there's something that you can do uh, to address that finally uh, i would say um again you know, I am a, um, I'm a business owner too. Uh, I own, I own nonprofits, you know, uh, I, I mean, I own a, a LLC. I own, you know, I, I also um, am starting another LLC with this, with this particular market. I am exploring the possibility of entering the market. Uh, and it, it doesn't look incredibly hopeful at this point. Um, uh, because I don't really, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I am somewhat privileged uh, you know, because, you know, I do understand some of the moving parts. Uh, I don't understand the market really well. Um, I, would op I would almost feel guilty um, taking advantage of the knowledge that I do know, understanding that there are some, some people that are out there who don't have access, the type of access that I have, quite frankly. I'm just being really honest with you about it. Um, I think I could, maybe I could figure it out. Uh, I don't have money to do this. I don't have land, um, and um, I'm not really heavily uh, confident in the ACCD. And I would just conclude by telling you that, you know, yeah, the, you know, there was a uh, half a million dollars that was kicked over to the ACCD uh, here, effective the beginning of June. 
Uh, and yeah, we're looking for the dispensaries to kick in another, I think, $50,000 each. That's all it sounds like. It's all one-time money. Uh, it doesn't look like any of it is recurring. Uh, further, within the ACCD, evidenced by the manner in which the ACCD has administered BIPOC biz small businesses, administered grants, loans, programming, technical assistance, and the lot, and the whole lot, the, the track record that they have, frankly, sucks. So the reason why we got, what is it, F S uh, uh, 159 that just came, just came across in this summer study or whatever it is where that $100,000 was set aside for folks to put out to contract, for folks to come in and, and bid on a contract to create some type of apparatus that would begin the process of getting their arms around what a black owned business is and how the ACCD is able to support them because we're at that level of capability maturity with the ACCD to put that $500,000 over at the ACCD right now and say that, hey, help the cannabis industry with black and brown folks, uh, be blessed, be gone, goodbye, is ridiculous. So, um, so I think you know, we need to really take a close look at the so-called um, bone that was thrown to us in this particular session regarding the use of the ACCD to administer $500,000 uh, in a program that faces black and brown folks that's broke. Or I should say it's working fine because maybe it was never designed to do what it is we're trying to get done here. Can I can I ask you about that, Mark? Um, I'll there. Thank you. I just have one question on that piece in particular. I mean, we have a little bit of latitude um, using our authority to help define social equity applicant. Um, I know ACCD is ultimately going to be the one who's administering the, the fund, but um, where, where did the definition, we're going to be hearing from some national folks that have spent a lot of time thinking about what's worked in other states and fundamentally what has not worked, because That's it seems to me like most <laughs> things have not worked. Um, but I'm curious where the definition in, in 414 that you, that you all, um, I assume had some some say over uh, the around um, what social equity ap applicant impacted areas, impacted families, et cetera. It, was that from Oakland? I, I, like I just did a quick Google search and it looks like it was from potentially Oakland. But I'm trying to think like, uh, you know, that's where we can try to we can try to kind of use our authority to, to kind of help direct ACCD and and have a good definition for who actually can access that money, however limited that money actually is. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for that, um, Mr. Chair. I think, um, you know, th I think there there is a synthesis that has occurred here in this policy. I can't rightfully say exactly, but I will say that it was heavily influenced by Illinois. Illinois. Uh, yep. It was heavily influenced by Illinois. Uh, it, it may, some, some, some yeah. of it may have bled over from other jurisdictions, and, and I think we tried to, um, massage this language to try to comport it to uh, who we are uh, yeah. in the state of Vermont, and I, I don't know how close we came to doing that. I hope that helps. No, it does help, and and that will help kind of guide us in our later half of this conversation with the you know the the folks from uh, Massachusetts, uh, you know Shalene Title and uh, Bo Kilmer about how those programs you know in Illinois and others have actually worked in, in actually delivering on some of these promises. Um, so absolutely. Thanks. And as far as the rules process is concerned, uh, you know, I'm again, I think part of what we're doing here is, is a lot of uncharted territory for those of us who represent um, some of these black and brown communities and just even maybe they're there. I think they're even, you know, I would even speak for members of our coalition. We're not really familiar with that process. I know it's steeped uh, in um, it, it's steeped in in white supremacy. The whole rulemaking process, and I say that unapologetically, uh, you know. So um, maybe that's the reason why it's it's you know part of it is such a secret to everybody. Uh, you know, I have a list of other processes that are governmental that I'll share with you in another presentation. But one of the things that um, concerns us is is that. You know, we want this process, you know, to be informed, um, to be con continuously, to be consistently informed uh, and centered, uh, centered in and informed uh, by those who are, are the least of us.
Um, so um, hopefully this is not a one shot. Um, my hope, uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, board, uh, as you know, I, I sense that it's, it's time it's time for me to go. But it's, my hope is is that we'll we'll have an ongoing. Our entire coalition will have an ongoing uh, dialogue uh, with you. Uh, we, we're not looking for any special privilege or anything. We appreciate the opportunity to speak into this body. Um, I appreciate your service. Um, these are challenging uh, issues that we're working with. Um, but I think that you know, I hope that everybody from our coalition has shown a willingness to work with you uh, and has been you know, forthcoming with any information um, that they have um, and has, has been willing also to reach out even into our own networks and pull other folks to the table for expanded conversations. Uh, we are open to hearing from other folks who, who, who we do not represent, who have differing opinions. We understand that you have a synthesis to perform and we have you know, complete confidence that you do it. We just want to make sure that you have all the information that you need to do it. We understand that the outcome is probably not going to be quite the way we'd like it to be. Uh, we know how sausage is made. Um, so again, um, thank you so much uh, for the time uh, this afternoon, and, and thank you so much uh, for the work that you've taken on. I would not want your job, but I appreciate uh, the fact that you've, you've all three signed up to do it. And again, congratulations to the executive director. I think that's probably the best choice we could have made in the entire state. Can I ask you one more question, Mark, about going back hey, to what you said? Come on, that's funny, dog. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Is that your mic drop? And I <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> you said something important, but I didn't want to interrupt you. So you talked about um, sort of like the, you know, the supremacy and systemic nature of like the rulemaking process and how it, for a lot of people, mm. it feels sort of shrouded in mystery. Um, mm. What is the best way for us to communicate out when we're going to make rules or when we start to the, to the point where we make real big decisions so that we can get we can get the influence of, of the public and people who might not normally go to our website to look for an agenda and so forth. How, what would you recommend that we do? Um, um, Julie, I'm, I am really sorry, but I'm, I'm going to ask you if you can restate uh, your oh, question sure. because I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm not able to follow it exactly. Um, so I guess what is the best way for us to communicate out in your opinion, when we're going to start rulemaking to encourage people to come and because there is a public comment process piece of that. How do we encourage people to join us for that part? I see. I see what you're saying. I think that um, yeah, I, I, if it was just that easy, I, I everything. He, here's what we're working with, and 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 this is this is part of what you're going to see in our um, our outreach efforts in turning the curve on systemic racism, uh, building back a healthier Vermont as we begin to teach people um, a common, a shared definition of systemic racism, and also to be able to know it when they see it, because nobody, you know, it's kind of like that justice is like, well, I don't know what pornography is, but I know if I saw it, I'd know it, you know, or something like that. So. So these very systems that you're talking about, you know, whether it is the the public outreach process, you know, name a title, name, you know, a group of black and brown and poor, disabled, or folks challenged with language who who are you know who are supposed to be involved in a public process, uh, and and an and entity or state agency is being paid uh, for that participation, but they can never seem to figure out how to reach that public that particular demographic, but yet and still they they realize, appreciate, and benefit from the the, the actual um, revenue that comes in, or people that look like them. Okay, so there. So I think there, this is much more complicated. Uh, I think you know it's borderline consultancy. Uh, I'd love to come in and, and get paid for what you're asking me, um, <laughs> but I think the um, the short story is 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 that. You know, whether it is the public engagement process, whether it is the appointment process, um, you know, whether it is a um, a process that seeks to uh, that dictates a um, this um, when you say communications, your communications, your public, your um, the fact that the two that two of you cannot talk at the same time. Um, what do you call that process? It's this. Um, um, open meeting laws. Open meeting laws. Open meeting laws. 
those, those processes, your, ex your executive, your executive sessions, um, you know, the, we, we are every, you know, our, our whole system is steeped in such a way to itself, itself healing, itself protecting, itself preserving. Uh, so we have to have a broader conversation about how to disrupt that, you know, and I can go on with a list of other things uh, that feed into this process and you are a part of it. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is, is I'm just trying to help as best I can. Um, but as far as how to go about uh, breaking down some of those barriers uh, in, in opening the door up and getting some light in so we can actually really make some progress, um, I think that that is a broader conversation that would um, that would be um, that would I think it would need to start at the executive branch. That would be a Susanna Davis conversation. Fair enough. So, so I have a couple comments, and they're not necessarily questions for you, Mark. So I'll let you leave on your on your mic on your mic drop. Um, thank you so well, much. I might for want your... to answer that. <laughs> okay. Well, I was just going to comment um, just very very um, quickly on the rulemaking process. I totally understand and respect that it's. It's nauseating for a lot of folks in the public world to understand uh, when's the best time to provide input. How do I provide input? Do I need an attorney to formalize a document for me to actually provide input? And I would just say, and maybe this is a topic that we can schedule a meeting around sometime when we're a little bit further down the road to <clears throat> make sure folks understand um, and you know, not without setting any any specific expectations, but you know, if if we put out a proposed rule, I mean, there's administrative techniques to kind of short circuit the traditional rulemaking process. I don't really anticipate any of that really happening here. Often that's done for for timing purposes more so than a public input purposes. And and I'll say that recognizing that some agencies at the federal and state level do it for other reasons, like trying to limit public input. Um, James Julian and I, I don't think, are trying to limit public input by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but you know, we're going to have to respond to each unique comment that is presented to us as it relates to a proposed rule, um, so on and so forth. I mean, the key word there is you unique, and that's just you know we can talk about that word and what it means from a legal perspective a little bit uh, further down the road. But we're going to have to respond to a comment on why we chose to make a decision one way or another. That's that's part of this process. So uh, what I'm trying to say is even if a comment wasn't incorporated into what we're trying to do, we're still gonna be on the hook, so to speak, for uh, helping the public understand why we went in a different direction. So that's not rulemaking 101. That's just my experience with the process um, based on my career. I wanted to circle back to a couple of things Mark said that I think are extremely important, and I experienced them in my time at the Agency of Agriculture that really helped a lot of folks at various different levels um, in and around the state, and that's business incubators and business accelerators, and borrowing some of those models from the ag sector where I've seen businesses graduate from an incubator level to an accelerator level to get out of those types of shared spaces sink themselves into their community and actually find success at the state and federal level with whatever product they're selling. We need to figure out a way to bring a lot of those types of concepts to the cannabis community, I believe. And that was a, a topic that I was trying to, to start untangling that ball of yarn with some of our business and technical providers um, at our meeting last week. Education is super important here in understanding how we can leverage, as you mentioned, Mark, community colleges, Maybe VTC, other other institutions that might be willing to, um, you know, help folks learn, um, not just the business end of things, but learn how, you know, this is going to work um, end of things as well. So thank you for touching upon those points very briefly. Um, it's really important. Is is this where I sign off? I'm sorry. Say it one more time. I said, is this where I sign off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I said, there are more, there are more comments than than questions for you. So, yeah, I appreciate it, um, Kyle, uh, James, uh, Julie. Again, um, and, and and all of y'all who are doing the work, I appreciate you. I I really, I I want to I want to work uh, with this pro in this process, and I I want to you know get other folks. More importantly, I, I want to get other folks. Who are interested in this process engaged so for those who are watching maybe now or folks who might i don't know that this is going to be available on the site uh you know reach out to the racial justice alliance vt racial justice alliance.org if you want to somehow or another get plugged into this process to help um you know 
to, to help stand this thing up. You know, again, I, I know that there, that industry and others are coming at y'all with rules already. You guys are, you, they, they come, they probably came with some kind of baked in Alec flavor, flavor type of pre, pre, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. But again, you know, the folks are running circles around us out there. You know it. Everybody else knows that they're running circles around us. Yeah, well, all we get is we get this little snippet, but you're getting a constant feed from these folks who do this for a living. I don't do cannabis for a living. Um, this is just one, you know, probably one half of 1% of what I do uh, with the Racial Justice Alliance. We don't even do policy for a living. Uh, that's probably about 20% of what we do as an alliance. So, I mean, we, we need you guys to fight for the little guys. We need you guys to push back on the guys that are, that are big guys that are coming in that are flooding you with stuff every day. And you know they are. Mark, so I would, yeah. Can I just respond to that quickly? Just uh, yeah. because what you do know, whether it's cannabis policy or not, is that if we want to do something bold and something outside of the normal kind of cookie cutter approach, um, we need a coalition behind us. We need, you know, everything we do. Uh, has to be approved in one way or the other by the legislature, um, either you know directly or indirectly. Um, and so we need that we need those voices calling their legislators and and helping us craft the the rules. And so I know you know that better than anyone, but I just wanted to just make that kind of the last the last word on that because it absolutely, it, Mr. Chair. And and I, I would also you know add to that you know that you know they could. Folks can feel re free to reach out to info at vtracialjusticealliance.org, info at vtracialjusticealliance.org. You know, if you are uh, someone in your or organization, somebody you know is interested in being a part of the uh, Vermont Equity, Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, because we're also building power there. We want to do that. Uh, the only thing I push back on, Mr. Chair, is, is that, uh, you know, there, there is a rulemaking process that you guys have that you have quite a bit of autonomy with. Yeah. Uh, and that, that is not a legislative process. That is an administrative process. And we, we know that. We may not know a whole lot about it, um, but I do think that a lot of the uh, philosophy, excuse the dog bark in the background, it's not mine. There's a lot of the philosophy that we adopt and the principles that we choose to um, inherit can manifest themselves in rules. So we, we, we're calling on you as well. Uh, we're going to put you know, it's good to pass the buck, but we're, I'm not going to let you off that easy. We're also <laughs> going to hold the body responsible as well. And those of us in the community, uh, we're going to bring the same type of um, accountability. We're going to ask for the same kind of accountability, and we will bring also the same uh, level of pressure, if necessary, on this body uh, to, to get you to do the right thing. Because we're just fighting for people. We're just trying to get, we're fighting for the small guy. It's all we're doing. Nobody's trying to get ahead here. We're just trying to fight for a small guy. So we're going to be asking you to do your job. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much for the time. I appreciate you all. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye, Mark. Um, do we know if Matt Leonetti is on the phone? I don't I don't see his name in our list of attendees here. If you are on the phone, Matt, um, you press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, great. Um, Julie, I'll turn things over to you. Sure, uh, Matt, I'll let you um, sort of introduce yourself and 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 kind of give us your background. But I think what you've offered to speak to us about today is about, um, you know, your experience in the criminal justice system and how that has impacted you, um, and what you uh, your thoughts on going forward. Okay, uh, sure. I can I can speak to that. Can can you all hear me? We can. Okay. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to kind of share some perspectives on this. I appreciate that considerably. Um, I'm Matt Leonetti. Uh, I am a convicted cannabis felon for a '98 uh, bust out in Arizona. Uh, from that point forward. Uh, that conviction has been very difficult to kind of overcome, uh, especially in the early days, because we did not have the sweeping legalization efforts early on that we're seeing now nationally. 
so it, it's definitely been uh, an uphill battle in certain instances. Uh, you know, to to kind of bring it to recent terms, I think the last two episodes where I had to declare this were one I was teaching, uh, coaching uh, rec soccer in Richmond. Uh, I had to write something about why I did what I did, uh, what happened, how I've come from that, how I've moved forward. Uh, same thing, I'm the tree warden for the town of Richmond. Uh, same thing when I applied for that position, I had to give a whole expose to the select board and everything about my felony conviction, which at this point, you know, we're, we're pushing 20 years. Um, so I am a convicted cannabis felon. Uh, I do have a degree in plant science and horticulture. Uh, I do run uh, Clean Green here on the East Coast, which is the largest nationally recognized and the longest running certification body in the cannabis industry, born in 2004, far ahead of any other programs. Um, I own and run a, an award-winning landscape and design firm, so I'm very well rooted in, in agriculture, horticulture. I've run diversified organic farms. I've been an advisor to the UVM farm, uh, so I, I am very well rooted in, in agriculture. Uh, I think that the difference that I carry is this, this felony conviction and seeing the ugly side of, of cannabis. So. You know, I, I lost everything. Um, and, you know, I, I, I will say I was young and dumb at the time. Um, I, from that day forward, I now have 23 years clean from heroin. I turned my life around from that point forward. I have two amazing, beautiful kids. Uh, but it's certainly not been easy getting over the stigma of, of being a felon. Uh, I was not allowed to go on a trip with my daughter to Canada because I am banned from Canada. I am banned from South Korea. Uh, I think something that happened 23 years ago, uh, especially for people that turn around and put their lives back together, uh, especially now that we're seeing legalization, uh, the one thing I would like to see is that for all nonviolent cannabis offenders, everything is fully expunged and those people are pulled from prison and released. Uh, there should not be a legal market while there are people still sitting in prison for this. That does not seem equitable. That does not seem just or fair. So my biggest thing is I would love to see everyone have their records cleared off so that they can gainfully get employment and other things without having to explain the significance of their actions as we move forward with legalization and allow others to profit. Um, you know, how how we create and what sort of parameters we put forward to allow this, I don't entirely know, but I don't know if there's a way to use some of the tax revenue to create grants or loans, uh, training programs, technical assistance for those in more impacted areas. Uh, we have to give them a chance to get in. Uh, I hate to bring up this term, but I'm going to, white privilege. Uh, it seems this cannabis industry is dominated by white folks that have investors and other things. Uh, and I don't see a lot of that within the minority communities. And so I think as we move forward, creating a, a framework that allows them to have an equitable footing getting into this, uh, you know, financial assistance, training, loans, uh, those kind of things I think are, are going to be a huge way we can possibly help that, uh, or we do it in areas that were negatively impacted uh, more so than, than others. So um, I'm not entirely sure if there's an opportunity for felons to get a reduced license uh, cost, uh, other ways to kind of bring a lot of people out of the black market, because I think that's what needs to happen. Um, somehow, you guys are going to have to gain a lot of trust from, from those of us and make it incentivized for us to come out and, and to move forward in this market. And, and again, I'm, I'm not an expert. I don't know exactly what all that looks like and entails. Um, but there has to be a level of trust on both sides moving forward. Um, and I'm, I know in talking to a lot of folks that are in this, uh, there still is, you know, I think a lot of people are waiting to see final language if they're going to jump in or not, if it makes sense, because a lot of people are pretty comfortable right where they are doing what they do. Um, I would love to be a part of, of, of this thing moving forward. Um, you know, I, I think some things too, 
that may accelerate and continue the black market, I think are THC caps. I think we are the only second state in the entire country that has those. So when we look at something along those lines of, you know, five milligrams is the max for the older demographic. Sure. That's great. You know, the 60 year old that wants to pop a teeny little edible to, to go to bed and help them. But we have other folks that need higher, higher counts to that. And if those accounts don't exist in the legal market, the black market will thrive in that arena. And there are already amazing concentrate markers out there. In removing those caps too, it also allows the craft artisans to create the products that they're good at without having to dilute them just to meet an arbitrary number. They don't want to take their bubble hash and dumb it down with CBD. Uh, <clears throat> so again, I think allowing them to do what they do best. And I understand we could have some some limits, but I think the limits are pretty stringent right now and, and pretty pretty out of line nationally with what we're seeing everywhere. And I don't think we're seeing detrimental effects from higher THC edibles. Of course, we're always gonna have a little kid that gets it here and a little kid that gets it there. Those stories happen all the time. Same with pharmaceuticals. We, that's just kind of part of it. Um, but I do think the THC caps are going to foster, if they stay in place, a very large segment of the market being illicit. And I don't see how we can have a legal market if we have a black market that is bigger and picks up pieces of parts of this. And I think, you know, something that came out very recently, which we're seeing in California, California has made a lot of mistakes from the minute they pressed Prop 215 and 96. Um, they are now walking it back and they're offering $100 million to help the legal market because it can't compete with the illegal market that's 75% of that state. So if we want to move forward, I think we have to find those ways to incentivize and get all of these people that want to be in it and that are good craft artisans and that are willing to put in the testing to make sure that their products are clean. Give them a chance. Give all of us a chance. I think ultimately, when I look at Vermont's bill, it seems a lot of it has been handed away to the five dispensary owners. And, and that's what I look at in terms of corporate cannabis. And it makes it very difficult for the small guys to get in. And I know those guys are fighting tooth and nail with their lobbyists to make it very difficult for us where they should be encouraging people to grow at home. And I think, you know, in, in taking this a step further, if we can alter and amend the current medical program, two plants and four plants is really, really small, especially if someone has an issue and makes a mistake. Uh, it does happen. This is agriculture. Pests and disease are all over the place. I have done this for a very long time. Sometimes I hit the ball out of the park. Sometimes we absolutely fail. And But when we're talking about someone's medicine that's on a fixed budget or an income that cannot afford to go to the dispensaries the home grow is the best option for them so i think home grows and amending the medical program will also allow the entire market to thrive so let's think about our medical patients and not just the tax revenue and the rec side of things these are people that need it far more than the rec market this is to you know quality of life so I would love to see the medical plant counts get changed. I'd love to see the caregiver plant counts get changed. Uh, more medical patients can take on more caregivers uh, because of the potential for mistakes. Um, and I think, you know, I think that would, would offer a, a big solution to a lot of people. The, the medical program really should stay in place, but I think we can amend it and make it much better because the plant counts comparatively to all the other states, we are at the bottom again. Um, and that's just not fair to some of these people that have been paying ridiculous prices for the last several years. Um, and I, I think, you know, that that's pretty much my spiel on, on show, social equity. I'm not really sure where else to go with a lot of these things, because I know a lot of states have put things in writing, but they have not implemented these plans. So seeing how some have not been implemented, I don't know how they're entirely going to work. I don't know how the tax revenue can fill into these things. And so I'm sure this is probably more so in your wheelhouse. But, um, you know, getting us felons an opportunity to get into this market because we were trailblazers or in my case, just stupid and young and doing something I probably shouldn't have done on that scale. But what's done is done. Um, 
So I would really like to find a way to, to get more of us out of this black market and into a market where we feel we have an equitable footing uh, for the small guy, because I feel we're up against some pretty big licenses right now, and, and we don't get some of the things that they've gotten. We've gotten virtually nothing in writing. They've gotten everything. And so we're all still kind of sitting here as question marks of, where do we get land? Can we get land that's ag land? Can does it all have to be commercial? I mean, there's just some fun things that are just not clear to to a lot of us yet. And I know that's part of this process moving forward. So I don't expect it all to be done. But um, you know, how do we get us felons into this market? Because we've been here a long time and, and we would love to, I don't care to make money. I just want to make people's quality of life better. And I, I'm pretty damn good at growing cannabis and I would like to have the opportunity to share that with people. Thank you, Matt. Julie, Julie, can I jump in? Yeah, go right ahead. Go. Thanks for being here, Matt. I think we've got a lot to learn from you that goes far beyond this con this con twenty minute conversation. And I look forward to to hearing more about your you know angles and pathways and your expertise um, through the cannabis marketplace moving forward. You know, we've heard a lot about THC caps and revamping the medical program, and, and that's something we're, we're paying attention to. And to, to one of your other points, I think a lot of folks are kind of waiting and seeing what they're, you know, if they're going to be interested in the regulated market because they want to see action instead of just our words. And, and I certainly appreciate that. And we're very cognizant of that. And I want to, I want to turn back to, you know, and I'm sure it's never fun or easy for you to constantly have to revisit um, the impacts of your felony conviction, but, but hopefully you might, uh, you wouldn't mind indulging me for just a couple minutes. So I'm thinking, you know, as we talk about social equity and a social equity applicant and understanding all these uh, compounded issues that are the result of, of your, of your conviction. You, you mentioned that you're a successful business owner uh, in a couple of different ways. And, I, and I'm wondering from a mortgage perspective, from a loan perspective, from an access to capital perspective, how has that conviction impacted your ability to just move a business forward? You know, separate from the cannabis specific expertise that you have, how can a conviction like that follow you um, long tw 20 plus years after, you know, that actually happened? Uh, you know, it, it's really only followed me in that, you know, I am banned from Canada. Um, and, and I think that was probably more so that I was crossing the border for, for 10 years after I moved up here. They finally caught it. Uh, I never knew I had to declare it. I never knew that I wasn't allowed to go there. They swiped my passport, said, don't come back here again. You will be arrested, this and that. So I walked into something that I wasn't really sure of the, the legal ramifications of my background because I didn't know international laws and, and moving from, you know, Arizona to here. I loved going up to Montreal. I loved going up to Quebec, uh, you know, getting out of Vermont and seeing a little bit of it. But I didn't know what Canada's laws were because partly they've got some things decriminalized over there and and legal over here so I didn't think that was so that was the biggest impact was crossing the borders um, I have been self-employed since I moved to Vermont so more so the employment thing has not really affected me because I could either hire or fire myself and say hey I'm not going to take you wait a minute it's me um, Ultimately, it was simply just, you know, the tree warden, because uh, I wanted to give some time back to the town of Richmond that I live in. Um, I didn't think that to be the warden of the public right away for trees, I would have to declare my my uh, my felony to, to run a, a rec soccer program. I didn't think I would have to give an expose on the background of, of everything after I have created um, everything. So I don't think it impacted any sort of loan process in any way. Um, some of that was never asked when I did apply for loans through my business. Um, it was just those few little things and then missing trips with the kids. Um, you know, sometimes I wouldn't apply for jobs when I thought I might want one only because I knew I'm going to have to declare that thing. And so again, it's kind of that stigma of, you know, I, I feel bad. I, I don't feel bad for what I did because I felt I was taking care of people. But uh, ultimately, in the eyes of the law, that was uh, not the case 23 years ago. So the impact for me, I think, was a little more minimal, ultimately, because I've been self-employed my whole life. So it hasn't hit me as hard. But there were those few examples where I was kind of bummed that I couldn't go on my daughter's trip with her. Um, little things like that, the little memories that I'll never get back, I'll never be able to share. Um, yeah, well, well, thank you. I mean, all that factors kind of into how we're going to start viewing these, 
these impacts of a conviction like that, whether it's shying away from applying to a job and maybe that's somewhere in this mar legal marketplace and I don't want folks with a, an illicit background in cannabis that might have a conviction shying away from the regulated market strictly for that purpose. And I think that's something that we're, you know, certainly going to be looking at and, you know, um, it's much appreciated for you to share your story. Sure. Of course. Uh, Pepe, do you have any questions that you want to ask? Uh, yeah, I, I, I've got a question that I'm going to ask both uh, Matt and Erica, if you don't mind, uh, me, Matt, me, my starting with you. Sure. Um, under the statute, Act 164, the board is required to obtain criminal history records of all applicants that have, I think, above a 10% ownership interest in any of our licenses. Um, what we do with those records is kind of up to us, um, with the kind of one qualification that we need to determine whether the criminal history record or the applicant based on the criminal history record poses a threat to public safety or the proper functioning of the regulated market. So those are the two kind of prompts we have to evaluate. Um, how would you suggest we do that? Um, how, like, what, you know, you've got a cannabis conviction from 20 years ago. I, clearly, to me, that does not pose a public safety threat or the proper functioning of regulated market. But I think we need to get a little bit specific for the public about how we're going to evaluate those. And I just would seek your advice um, about those two points. Oh, that's a good question. Uh... Uh, yeah, and I don't know how big this process is going to get. I don't know how many licenses and things are going to come in. I don't know how many backgrounds are going to need to be checked. But I, I honestly think, you know, if, if there is the opportunity to do it, if it's a case by case basis, because I think everything is so different and everything is so unique uh, individually. Um, I've never felt that mine has been that bad. It was a nonviolent cannabis conviction for cultivation. Uh, I've always said that, you know, I never thought the impact went far greater than me and I only hurt myself. But when my parents got up and spoke at my sentencing hearing, I, I felt that and I learned that the reach of my actions is far greater than myself. Uh, so I needed to take my blinders off a little bit. Um, I, I, again, I, I think it would really come down to when did that conviction happen? Uh, what has that person done uh, to remediate that? What have they done since? Has there been repeated infractions thereafter? Uh, you know, I think the story for, for everyone should start at where that first conviction is, where they have gone, what they have done since. Uh, I would assume violent convictions are probably immediately tossed out, which I, I would certainly think so. Um, you know, that's a really tough one. I, I think everyone's situation is very unique, and I, I don't know if if, if there is a, a single set of standards that could be put to each. I'm, I'm sure there certainly could be certain parameters that would be laid over, over each person, but uh, I, I think, you know, just kind of very similar to having to give a spiel about myself uh, for running a rec soccer league as well as being a tree warden allowed them to have a better understanding of me where i have come from who i am today and not who i was 23 years ago um i, I think would allow a little more personalization and an opportunity to get to know those people uh at their present state uh, and see how that fits with the framework of the bill that you guys are, are going to create for us um, so I don't know if that really answered much, but uh, no, kind of my thoughts. It, it really is helpful. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. welcome. Yep. Do we have any other questions for Mark? No questions, Matt, just okay. from me, from me, Matt. I know that you've got a lot of other expertise as it relates to growing environmental considerations. And I look forward to engaging you as as we move into that process to get a, an understanding of where where you're thinking. Oh, and I, I would love to have the opportunity to share that I've been in cannabis for a long time. And I, I think, you know, my partner very well, Jesse Lynn, we are, are very strong advocates of, of clean cannabis uh, and testing and, and making sure that the products going out are safe. So when the opportunity arises, if there's an opportunity to, to hear me out and, and some of the clean green framework, I, I would love the opportunity to share all of that info as well at the, at the proper time for sure.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your time, Matt. And um, I really appreciate you sharing all of this with us. Uh, I, I appreciate your time and taking to, you know, your time, your valuable time as you navigate all this to, to actually listen to, to, to me and to all the other small cultivators out there. So greatly appreciate it for sure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your time. Thank and you. I think, I think that Erica is here. I am here. Okay. Um, Nellie, is Erica able to, oh, there, oops. is she able to turn her camera on? She should be able to, yes. Okay, good. There she is. Okay, when I hit on, it says it's off, and when I hit off, it says it's on. I'm sorry, can y'all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so I'm trying to turn it on. Okay, I can see myself in the bottom corner of the screen. Okay, got it. We can see you. Good. Great. Pepper, did you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, so, Erica, thanks for joining us. Um, you and I met, you know, virtually very briefly. Uh, we were both testifying on an expungement bill. And your story was very compelling, and your openness and frankness about it was very compelling to me personally. And, um, you know, I don't know how you feel about cannabis policy, but I think that we would love to hear just um, how criminal history records have stuck around in your life and impacted you um, long after you had completed your sentence um, and, you know, repaid, uh, you know, repaid your debt to society and just how we as a board um, might not want to use criminal history records in the kind of traditional sense that they're used in and how we might be able to think differently about them, especially as it relates to getting into the cannabis industry and, and getting licenses in the hands of, of folks that may, may have uh, been previously targeted uh, for um, enforcement or um, have been rehabilitated, have served their, have served their sentence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't, I assume that you're not going to get in the cannabis industry or, you know, if you want to, that's great. Um, <laughs> just love, would just love to kind of hear your story and, and hear about the collateral consequences of your conviction. And, and then we have, I think, probably a few questions for you at the end. Sure. Um, well, in just listening to the conversation so far this morning, I would just say, well, first of all, you absolutely should look at criminal history. Um, and it should be a factor in consideration. Obviously, you want to make sure that you know you're not uh, giving a, a a grant. You're not granting a permit to a violent offender, somebody who has demonstrated a lack of consideration for the public trust. So it, it's it's interesting. And I I think I was talking about this with Julie originally. I believe, you know what you're talking about is potentially giving licenses to people who have already demonstrated that they will break the law. And so we'll, well, oh yeah, but it's weed. So it's whatever now and blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, but when it was illegal, the people were willing to commit crimes to participate in that. So it's a weird area to be like, okay, well, this person had convictions previously and now we should just trust them, even though we couldn't trust them before, but it's the same thing. You see, so I understand you're in like a weird spot there. So to me, looking at criminal history is really important. Um, do they demonstrate a history of criminality? Is it continuous? Is it is it various things? Did they just get picked up because they had a gram of pot in their pocket like 10 years ago? Yeah, probably you don't have to worry about that person. But if it's repeated, history of a person who has demonstrated a lack of care and consideration for the law, I'm not sure why you would want to trust them with this now. So I just want to throw that out there. So to me, for you guys setting up the rules, rather than reinventing the wheel, I would probably just take something like, what does a person have to demonstrate in order to get their record expunged? If I, as a person, say say you're looking at criminal records, is this crime eligible for expungement? And if they apply for one, could they get it? Um, because I think Matt mentioned this, and, and I'll share my story in just a moment. 
you don't know. Like, I think you're really going to have to take all of these on a case by case basis. And to me, there's already a framework for you to do that by looking at what the expungement process is and if the person would qualify for it. I don't think you have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so I also have a felony conviction. And I think one of the reasons why I specifically was encouraged to share is because 15 years ago, that crime, I did not have to be convicted of a felony. And I didn't know that I could have said no to accepting that plea deal. Um, you know, I was a drug addict. I didn't have anyone to advocate on my behalf. I had a public defender who did not really care about me or my circumstance. And I mean, understandable. I was an asshole back then. I was a drug addict. Like a lot of people in the middle of their addiction are just jerks. And so it's not always surprising when you hear about public defenders not doing the best that they possibly can for their for their um, for their client because we I was really sick. And a lot of people when they're getting arrested and convicted are very sick. So I don't totally blame him, but I could have been charged with a misdemeanor. And since 2006, when I was convicted, I've seen multiple people charged with the same crime, embezzlement, for far more than me. I think it was a few years after I got convicted. A woman got busted for stealing like $100,000 from St. Albans or something like that, and she only got probation. But I got a felony conviction, and I served time in state prison and was on probation until my restitution was paid in full. So sentencing across crimes is not the same depending on which county, which judge, which public defender, or you know, even which crime. So it's worth making sure that as you do this, you're looking at individual cases. And like I said, having the framework already for expungement, I think is a great place to start from. Maybe you need to tweak it a little bit specifically for this. Um, but that would be a great place to start. Um, and I just totally take any questions. I'm happy to talk about it. I have no shame about my past. So you can ask me whatever you want to ask me. Um, I would just like to say um, it's been interesting to hear people talk about the social equity pieces. And so just to go on record, you know, Vermont is primarily a white state. And when I was in college and in my 20s and early 30s, uh, Vermont was still one of the whitest states in the union. And so I, in my opinion, if you're gonna prioritize who to give um, certificates to, licenses, licenses to, or whatever, it should be prioritized to Vermonters and people with a history in Vermont. So there may be um, a desire to want to appear to be racially fair, but if you give a license to a black person who's only lived in Vermont for two years, instead of somebody like a, a Matt, I'm not saying you Matt, but somebody like a Matt, somebody who's lived here for decades and been involved in the, in the scene and in whatever for decades, um, if you're gonna give it to a black person who's only been here for two years instead of a white person who's been here for 20 years, I think that's a mistake. Um, and I think that whoever you do give licenses to should have ties to the community. So it shouldn't be somebody who moved here five minutes ago. It should be somebody here with family here. It should be somebody who grew up here. It should be, it should be people with ties to the community so that you can ensure that the people you're giving licenses to actually care about Vermont and actually care about Vermonters and don't just care about appearing to be uh, uh, woke or just, don't just appear like they're doing something and, and people who just moved here to take advantage uh, of our laws. So that is my two cents on that piece and I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you, Erica. Kyle, uh, James, questions? I do have a question. Um, so, Erica, this is a, a similar question that I asked. Oh, Matt. I can't hear you guys. Oh, sorry. Let me know if you can hear us. Oh, there you go. I hear that. Okay. So, uh, 
Erica, this is a similar question that I asked Matt, um, which is, and you've already touched on it a little bit, but um, you know, we are required to um, obtain and consider criminal history records of all of our applicants. Um, uh, we're not, um, you know, the the mere fact of a criminal history record uh, or a conviction does not preclude uh, license license ownership, um, but. We're required to um, determine whether the an applicant with a criminal history record presently poses a threat to public safety or the proper functioning of a regulated market. I hear what you're saying about um, using the expungement uh, criteria, uh, and you know, for those who aren't aware, there's certain crimes that are qualifying. You have to have a waiting period where you haven't had a subsequent conviction, and um, there's a few, you have to have completed your sentence and, um, you know, there's a few other uh, criteria, but um, your crime, your conviction is not expungement eligible. Um, Correct. And, and it's, it's also, even if it was, you have a very unique circumstance around your restitution order and, and you know, things have changed since then. Um, you know, what do we do for the folks uh, like you that, uh, are not eligible for expungement for one reason or another, but seem to clearly be, um, you know, in a good place to own a license, um, you know, that are before us and they're demonstrating to us that they, that they could participate. Yeah, great question. Um, I think that's why I said, I think it, the expungement criteria is a really good place to start. So you've got this framework, right? There's like certain crimes, there's time frames. There's deadlines, things you have to complete. I think that's a great place to start. Now, for somebody like me, you could go, okay, well, if all things were equal, Erica could get an expungement. Like, this is something in theory that she could do. I also, just for the record, I have a pardon application that has been sitting on Governor Scott's desk for three years that anybody who's read my application, seen my information, would gladly grant me the pardon. Um, I hate, I don't want to be like arrogant, but um, I'm, I even, my probation officer said I was a model probationer. Okay. Like oh, when the, when the correction system is saying, give Erica a shot, like, you know, that there's something going on. Um, so I'm sorry. I'm just having weird problems with my sound. Can you guys still hear me? Mm -hmm. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the framework to start from. Obviously, if if people have demonstrated a history of violence, I would not trust them with people. I just I just wouldn't. Um, again, if it's been ten years, if a person has put their life back together, um, if they have demonstrated, I think that given the what's the right word I want to use. Given the sensitivity and the responsibility of owning any kind of a license where you're uh, providing hallucinogens to people, the, the clearance for getting permission for that should be up here. Um, I, I, it, it's nice to say we want to be equitable. It's nice to say we want to give people a chance. It's nice to say we want to be inclusive. Um, but you guys, should always be keeping in the back of your mind that you are granting people permission to sell a hallucinogen to people. So should that be an easy mountain to climb? If someone does have a criminal record, in my opinion, they should have to at least do the same level of work that I had to do for an expungement application or a pardon application um, to demonstrate that they can be trusted selling a hallucinogen to people. Can I, uh, <laughs> can I just clarify one point there? Because I yes. think I thought I was clear, but maybe I'm not. Um, yeah. I, I thought what you were saying is that whether someone's gone through the expungement process or not, or the pardoning process, um, if they are technically eligible under the criteria, we should treat them as if they've been expunged for the purposes of uh, licensure. It's those folks that aren't technically eligible that we should do on a case by case basis. I I would say so. I mean, I would think that technically, if they went through a process that was similarly set up as expungement, 
it, it would, it, that is the same as on a case by case basis, right? Because you can't just apply for an expungement and then get it. It has to be reviewed people like, so when I say use the same process, like what kind of documentation do people have to provide? What sort of review is done by the corrections department? How, you know, what is the step-by-step -step process and things that a person has to provide in order to even be considered for an expungement? So I would say it should be a similar process to that, regardless of whether or not they would actually be eligible for it. Okay. Can yeah, I, ask I only oh. mentioned that. Uh, sorry, I only mentioned because you know expungement um, is somewhat complicated. I know legal aid does a lot of work to help provide um, legal assistance to people seeking expungements, but uh, you know sometimes it requires an attorney. Certainly, um, you know it's, it, it is. Getting that actual expungement order approved um, can be an additional barrier, but I think we as a board can treat people that are expungement eligible, that they're technically met all of the criteria, as if they've been expunged. Well, and just keep in mind, like I had legal aid help me with my pardon application and my expungement application that is free of charge. And I will just state again, if you can't count on people to go through the process of an expungement and getting that stuff together, then you cannot trust them to sell drugs to people. Okay. I mean, remember, this is like a pharmacist. Pharmacists have to go to college and get certified and get degrees and all this other stuff. And we're literally talking about homeboy off the street, Joe Schmo, Joe Blow, coming in and being like, hey, give me an application. And oh, by the way, I'm a felon. Like, okay, well, okay, no big deal. Like, no. You're literally giving someone permission to sell drugs to people. This should be hard. This should be hard. It should be a hard and complicated process. And the person should need help to do it. And the person should be willing and capable of going through the process. And if they are not willing and capable of going through that process, you should not trust them to sell drugs to people. Okay. Erica, was there a wait when you sought help from legal aid? Was there, did you have to wait for that? Or was there a, I, I'm, I'm, un, I'm admitting some ignorance in this process. So I'm yeah. trying to understand what is it that people have to do to get to that expungement and, and get the resources that you had access to? Hey, it's Erica Reddick. I want to apply for an expungement. Okay, here's the instructions. And then I got together what I could. I wrote what I could. I assembled everything that I had, and then um, uh, Maraid O'Reilly, I hope I said her name correctly, was the person who helped me. And so she gave me the instructions, she kind of gave me some direction, I compiled everything that she asked me to, and then I sent it to her, and then she reviewed it, okay, hey, change the language here, hey, you might want to touch up your essays there, blah, 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 blah. Um, for me... I probably took like a month to get it done because I also had to get, you know, I got like 15 letters of recommendation. They only asked for three, but I was like, screw that. I'm getting one from like everyone I know because um, I got clients and AA people and um, uh, friends, family, you know, I got across the spectrum. Um, so I went harder probably than most other people necessarily might or have to, uh, but it really was not that complicated. You know, the hardest part, honestly, was like having to call corrections because I didn't have, um, I, I couldn't find a copy of my discharge paperwork. So I had to call and get a copy of it from the court. And it cost me like two bucks or something stupid like that. But it wasn't hard. And again, if you can't trust people to read directions and get some letters and write a couple essays, then you cannot trust them to sell drugs. Good question, though. I appreciate the question. Hi, Erica. This is Kyle Harrison. It's it's nice to meet you. I don't believe we've had the pleasure of of meeting before. And I think if I'm if I'm thinking about how to best sum up your um your your comments, at least at the tail end of this discussion, it's it's the board really needs to weigh accessibility. Is everybody just being quiet or? Oh no. <laughs> nope. I lost my sound again. What is this doing? So, I'm sorry, guys. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, All right. sir. I'll, be, I'll start over and I'll be quick because I know we're running out of time. Okay. Um, nice to meet you, Erica. Thank you for being here and sharing your story. My name is Kyle Harris. 
Um, and what I was going into is the tail end of your comments. I think what I what I'm hearing is we really need to weigh accessibility into our legal marketplace with the respect and quality of the marketplace with which we're trying to stand up. And and I think we've got a lot of hard thinking to do on where to draw some lines in the stand in the sand, recognizing that we want to be as equitable and in inclusive as we as we possibly can. Um, I, I have a question for you, and it's similar to the, the one that I asked Matt, and, and maybe your ex experience and, and your felony convictions might make, and you know, employment history, so on and so forth, might make um, this question easier or harder for you to answer. I don't, I don't know, but thank you for your willingness to revisit um, what I know for a lot of folks is one of the hardest times in their life. So uh, much appreciated. Um, I asked Matt a question about uh, give me the um, compounding effects of your your criminal conviction, whether it's going to get a mortgage or a business loan or a personal loan, so on and so forth. You know, I asked Matt in the context of trying to move folks from the illicit marketplace into the regulated marketplace. But there's a lot of folks out there that I would imagine have convictions that have no experience with cannabis that may be interested. So um, from your perspective and that perspective, um, I'm curious what barriers to entry might you see that that um, you know we should look out for, assuming that somebody can kind of do that hard work, check the boxes to to make sure that they're not a, a violent um, felon, so on and so forth. But but are having trouble accessing capital or loans or you know commercial real estate or so on and so forth. Yeah, great question. Um, and can you guys still hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so I definitely struggled to get employment. I have very, I've had barriers to employment. Um, my husband and I have had barriers to housing. So even though it was a 15 year old felony, there's places we can't rent. Um, so I definitely have lived uh, in pretty ghetto neighborhoods like in Austin and um, other places because that's all you can get. They're the only people willing to rent people with criminal records. Um, I have not had a problem getting access to capital. Um, or a mortgage or anything like that as a result of my conviction. Um, but like job, having a hard time getting jobs, like let's be real, I'm an accountant and I stole money to support my drug habit. And then people have a hard time wanting to trust me doing their accounting, like shocker, okay? <laughs> I don't begrudge anybody that. Um, and anybody who has, especially if the person is, is working from um, being rehabilitated or in recovery from substance abuse, if they tell you that they didn't deserve or don't deserve every problem that they have as a result of their conviction, they are not fully recovered from whatever it is they say they're recovered from. And that's the truth. So I take 100% full responsibility for the decisions that I made. And yes, I was the victim of society, if you will. I had been drugged and sexually assaulted. The person who did it was not convicted for lack of sufficient evidence. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, right? Like you can look at my past and you can go, oh look, Erica was the victim of society. This is blah blah blah. Fill in the blank. Oh my God, this is too bad, right? But I still made the choice to do drugs. I still made the choice to steal from my employer to support my habit. And as a result of that, I deserve whatever the consequences are of that choice. And anybody who tells you otherwise in my personal opinion, is not actually recovered from their substance abuse because they have not taken responsibility for what is theirs to take responsibility for. So I do not begrudge anyone having a hard time being willing to trust me. I do not begrudge the additional hurdles I've had to overcome as a result of that. And it makes my success today even sweeter because I have had to overcome so many more obstacles because I put them in my own way, right? Like those obstacles I have to have had to overcome are my own fault and I put them in my way, but I overcame them. And as a result of being, over, being able to overcome that, I have better self-esteem, I have integrity, I have discipline, and I can feel good about where I've come from. I've earned my dignity back by overcoming those obstacles that I put in my own way. And anybody that is really truly recovered from addiction, alcoholism, or anything like that will tell you the exact same thing. So that is not what's going to get in the way of people getting into the marketplace. 
I think uh, I heard a little bit of the conversation earlier. I can tell you the hurdles for getting into the marketplace have already been put in the way by the legislature. Uh, nobody, dude down the street selling dope to his neighbors is not gonna come get a license. He's not gonna start charging 30% tax. Anybody who buys dope from their neighbor is not gonna go to the dispensary and pay 30% more with the taxes. They're not gonna wanna go through regulated markets. They're not gonna wanna give you their name. They're not want, gonna wanna go on a list. Nobody wants to do that. And so in my opinion, the legislature has set this up to fail right from the start. And that has nothing to do with criminal background checks or people with criminal backgrounds wanting to get into the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions for Erica? Just looking at the time, Mr. Chair. I don't have any other questions, Erica. It's so nice uh, for you to be so open about this with us. Um, and you know your perspective is is an important one. So so thank you once again for having to relive this kind of time in your life and for, help, <laughs> for help guiding anytime, us. Anytime I get to use it for the good of my neighbors, it is well worth every minute of it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Um, so we would like to do um, some public comment. Um, and, uh, you know, we are, we have a kind of hard start uh, at 1240 when um, we have another witness, but um, I think it would behoove us to do a little bit of public comment right now. We're going to start um, with uh, the folks that have joined uh, via the link and can raise their virtual hand. Um, and um, and then we'll move to the folks on the phone. So anyone who's on the phone that would wish to make public comments, please just wait till I uh, move to the phone. Um, and we're going to start uh, with Dave Silverman. Dave, can you unmute yourself? Uh, thank you, Chair Pepper. Um, I just want to uh, touch base on, on expungements and, and the use of expungements. I, I, well, certainly, I, I would not object to your creating a criteria where any expungement eligible offenses are deemed expunged to start with. Uh, I really want to urge you not to limit um, it to that. Our expungement laws are really, really weird and nonsensical. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Um, eluding a law enforcement officer is, a, is an expungable offense if you do it with a car, but it's not expungable if you do it in a snowmobile. Um, because that if you do it in a snowmobile, that's a predicate offense. Uh, and, and if you do it a second time, you can be charged more um, uh, with higher penalties than when you do it the first time. And predicate offenses are, according to statute, not expungible. Uh, and we don't actually have a good list of all the predicate offenses in law. Uh, there are many, many of them. Um, so things like uh, reckless driving is not expungible. Uh, and it's a crime in Vermont. It's not a traffic ticket. Um, and, and so... I, I really want to try to steer you away from looking at expungible crimes as being the only things that should be looked past. Um, the legislative intent of the language that you referred to, Chair Pepper, uh, was to um, exclude people who uh, are actively posing a threat to society. So, you know, violence, the, the active threat of violence. Um, as well as organized crime. That, that the language around proper function of the regulated market was intended to exclude organized crime from the market. Um, and so I, I really, I beg you to narrowly focus on the statutory language here um, and exclude as few people as possible. Uh, because again, as we talked about last week, your overarching goal, one of your main overarching goals is to bring in your existing sellers into this market and, and the more barriers you put in place by excluding them based on certain criminal histories the less will succeed at, at that goal thank you very much yep thank you david and thank you dave for uh for your work on expungement as well um i'm just gonna i i see three more hands raised i'm gonna skip around a little bit only because susanna davis has not provided public comment yet um so susanna if you could um unmute yourself um and thank you for joining us. Buenas tardes. Thank you both for having 
me. Um, well, I suppose it wasn't your choice. It's an open meeting. But um, I just, I wanted to touch on a few of this. So I've been bouncing in and out of this hearing throughout the day to cover other meetings. But um, from what I've heard throughout the day, I just want to touch on a little bit of it and re-examine it from an equity lens. I can't help myself. That's how I am here available to you as a committee. So um, I really appreciate all of the commentary and the testimony so far, especially from people who have lived experience with the justice system on cannabis enforcement. That's incredibly important. I'm getting a bad network quality warning, so I apologize if my audio is choppy. Um, and I just want to, again, cast all of this in, in kind of an equity light. I actually would agree with the con with Dave's comment about not limiting ourselves only to expungible offenses um, as a you know presumptive um, approval and um, and the reason for that again is because you know the the idea or the expectation is that if something has been deemed uh, expungible it's because that is the only universe of things that should be expungible. But we also know that law and morality are not always the same thing, right? They're sometimes incongruous. And so I would encourage us to look beyond the scope of what the law permits. Um, and on that note, I do also want to address some of the comments that were made prior, which are um, the idea about who should or should not be eligible based on other factors, other processes, or other criteria. For example, we did hear the comment that if we can't trust a person to go through the expungement application process, then we can't trust them to um, you know, be, be licensed or participate in this market. And I think that, that that kind of a comment, while I recognize, I understand where it comes from, right, about demonstrating a certain level of um, stick to I, I recognize and respect where that comes from, but it's reflective of immense privilege, immense privilege to be able to say that because you were able to navigate a bureaucratic and deeply complex process that therefore everybody should be able to do it, that if you had no barriers, other people don't have other barriers, and that people cannot be good at B if they didn't complete A. And what you all already have known in your experiences and your various professional experiences is that oftentimes people, particularly from historically marginalized groups, have been defeated by the system in so many other ways that going through another process, through a legal system that's already failed them, what would be the point in a lot of people's eyes, right? So I wouldn't necessarily look at failure to begin or complete one process as an indication of inability to be great at something else. I also recognize the idea of holding people to a certain standard, being able to say, well, if I had to go through something, you should at least have to go through that much. And we hear that a lot in contemporary, in contemporary discussion around things like, I don't know, student debt. Well, it's not fair to absolve such and such because if I had to suffer under this unfair system, then other people should have to suffer too. And I, I really encourage us to rethink that, right? We know that the American legal system is flawed in so many ways. And yet, because we've had system failures in the justice system that have impacted people today, we should atone for that for those people. But that doesn't mean we have to leave those same oppressive systems in place and have other people suffer under them, right? If we know it's bad for the people who've gone through it, why continue something bad for new folks? So similarly, I would encourage us to look toward newer and better and different ways of going through this process instead of saying, we're gonna uphold the same unfair standards that we've already been upholding because it would be unfair to the people who've already gone through that. And the last thing I just wanna remind people of, again, I can't help myself as a person who is new to Vermont from two years ago, I just wanna remind the board that tenure in this state is not synonymous or interchangeable with who cares about the state or who has ties to the community. I've known a lot of people who have come affirmatively to be a part of Vermont's community, who have done more for their local, for their towns and, and communities in the short time they've been here than some people who've lived here their whole lives. And I know that there are some folks who do have ties to the community who may have done more harm than good in their time here. And so I would just remind us as we consider priority, um, you know, that that we not just base it on this sort of in-state, out-of-state xenophobia or this sort of, you know, you're a flatlander and I've been here for 29 generations and therefore I'm somehow more of a Vermonter than you are. Because that's the same kind of thinking that contributes to the high churn rates that we see for people of color in Vermont 
who often report that they leave because they felt unwelcome, because they felt like outsiders, because they were repeatedly told they didn't belong. Um, and again, you know, if we're trying to accomplish multiple objectives, like raising the state's birth rate, increasing the number of students being enrolled in schools here, increasing the retention um, of, of job markets and major employers, these are all things that are at least in part fueled by whether Vermont and Vermonters see themselves as welcoming and really act at that welcoming. So I would again remind us um, that tenure is not the same thing as investment, personal investment. And I'm gonna stop there. That's that's what I got so far. <laughs> Susanna, thank you for that. And um, you know, you're statutorily required to help us, but we would seek your help anyway, I think, um, on the social equity programming and the social equity applicant definition. Um, and it's gonna be a huge part of our conversation at 1240 and, and beyond. And I would hope that you could join us kind of as an honorary board member um, to help um, talk with uh, Bo Kilmer and Shaleen Title about those very issues. Um, so thank you for that. And um, next on my list is uh, Graham. Hi, folks. He caught me. She's still napping here. That's great. We're over two two hour mark now. That's impressive. <laughs> um, this is Graham, Policy Director at Rural Vermont. And I just want to, first of all, thank Susanna for everything she just shared. I think she captured a number of responses to some of the comments that Erica made in particular that I, I would have made as well. Um, you know, I think clearly, you know, Mark Hughes is a member of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition with Rural Vermont and a number of other organizations that we are colleagues with. Um, appreciated much of what was said by the other witness today as well. Um, but, I, a, you know, I think one thing, um, today is about social equity, and I hope there's also a day for criminal justice reform conversation, because they are not the same thing, although they are often related. Um, so I didn't come today prepared to speak on criminal justice reform, but I'd like to quickly say that, you know, although we talk about decriminalization having happened in Vermont, um, as has been said, um, the type of decriminalization, decriminalization that has happened more or less, it, it certainly allows a number of people to be free from um, a, a particular type of convictions, and um, that is excellent. However, it largely maintains criminalization across most of the cannabis marketplace. It really just allows people to possess very small amounts and to grow very small amounts, and people will be making incredible profits and are making incredible profits, so some people are still in prison or facing the results of past incarceration and do not face any sort of reparation from that. So I don't think we should speak about decriminalization having in Vermont. We could talk a little about market capture, you know, by limited decriminalization perhaps. Um, and, you know, one thing that was said um, was about people's willingness to repeat offend um, in the face of the law. And I think one thing we should keep in mind is that we're here today because we recognize the history of prohibition and criminalization as fundamentally xenophobic, racist, and classist. Um, this is not about people being willing to be out of compliance with cannabis laws. It's about the laws and lawmakers' complicity in criminalizing people and their behavior. And people face severe consequences in their lives. I personally know people who have had to make choices about whether they're going to serve time in prison before or after their child is born. I know people who were removed from their families and subsequently uh, sexually assaulted in foster care. Those people and their families are, are not facing any sort of reparatory process from the state right now. Um, just keep that in mind. Um, I want to quickly, you know, speak to what we came here to take talk, which is racial equity. And you spoke earlier, Kyle, you asked specifically about um, zoning and how commercial zoning or ag zoning or lived experience. Different zoning um, may um, impact racial equity. And you know, as Mark spoke to earlier, he gave a number of statistics about how people of color, inequities in, in wealth and access in, in communities of color versus white communities in the state. I don't think I need to revisit those numbers. Um, but we know that he mentioned the lack of access to capital and land um, is, and knowledge are some of the preeminent factors, you know, limiting um, BIPOC participation in this marketplace. We heard similarly from Nikki last week that, you know, lack of access to capital and land is, is an issue amongst farmers, but we know even more so when you are a person of color, you face historic discrimination or current discrimination, and that's compounded even more so. Um, 
So I mean, we're running short on time, but I, you know, it's not to de-emphasize the point that you're making right now. Um, can I quickly just finish the, the points then? Uh, yeah. What I really wanna make a point is that the scale appropriate regulations and our ag and economic equity points, um, they are about access to land, access to capital and access to the market. Therefore, they will disproportionately impact those who have the least amount of capital and the least amount of access currently. Ag zoning doesn't mean you have to produce on ag land. It means that local municipal zoning regs don't apply to what you wanna do. So if you have ag zoning for outdoor production, the people could grow on their residential property, they could grow on ag zoned land, they could grow on commercially zoned land. Um, and if you made indoor production also available in residential areas, as we heard last week from retailers, a lot of people grow in their homes. They could have home-based businesses. Um, all these recommendations, I think, would also impact this community um, of people that we're talking about here today. Um, Thank you. I'll leave it there. That sounds like you'd like to move on. Yeah, and we'll have one more public comment period um, after our witnesses uh, later today. Um, and I, I I see two more hands up. I think I actually need to just limit the public comment period right now. Again, we we will have one more public comment period, but um, we have two witnesses coming at uh, 1240, and I need to allow um, Kyle and Julie to kind of take just a quick break before uh, we, we do those. So I'm sorry for the two folks with their hands up, but we will come back to you at uh, two two thirty when when our witnesses are done. So with that, Nelly, could you throw up our away message and um, just pause the record? Well, at this point, you don't have to really pause the recording, but um, maybe you could just throw up the away message until twelve forty. Okay, it looks like we're all here. So. Um, we're back. Uh, this is the Cannabis Control Board meeting, um, June 17th. It's 12.40 p.m. And um, we have um, Bo Kilmer. Um, you know, Bo has been so influential in cannabis policy nationwide. He has laid the groundwork, really, for cannabis tax and regulate and, and just uh, home grow legalization in Vermont. He, he started people getting people feeling comfortable with the idea that if so many folks in Vermont are using this product uh, regularly, then uh, maybe we should consider a safer tested packaged labeled product. Um, and um, he was, you know, seminal in my thinking about uh, cannabis policy. And honestly, if the cannabis board had a blank check, I would do whatever we could to get him to come to Vermont and help us some more. But it, in the meantime, he is uh, very willing um, to come talk to us. And um, today, Bo, we are focused on social equity, what's been working across the state, what's um, what hasn't been working, um, how we can um, kind of learn the lessons and try our best to kind of get this right and maybe find a way um, that other states haven't haven't tried um, as we think about social equity and the definition of a social equity applicant. I would just say um, um, we're three board members, um, Kyle, Julie, and myself. We're not going to understand all the nuances of this issue. Um, we've been given the benefit of an advisory committee um, we have some of those advisory committee members on right now um, that I'd like to kind of have them act as honorary board members um, because they're going to help us kind of craft our social equity programming and our social equity definition. So, um, Nader, I, or Nelly, could you re-enable um, Nader Hashim's um, camera if it if it was disabled? Great. So Nader um, is a uh, was just recently, I think yesterday or the day before, appointed as our advisory committee member um, with an expertise in systemic social justice and equity issues. Um, and so he is here. Uh, Susanna Davis, um, would you mind just uh, popping up if you're willing? Great. Susanna Davis. Um, has the first of her kind uh, role in Vermont. Um, she's our director of racial equity um, and has been for about two years. And um, and she, um, pursuant to Act 164, is going to um, really help us dig into social equity. And you know, Bo, your time is incredibly valuable, so I'd love to just turn things over to you. But you know, I would like to encourage Susanna and Nader and Julie and Kyle to ask 
questions of you, um, depending on how you want to, I'll leave it to you, Bo, how you want to present, but um, uh, if these folks have questions, I think, you know, they're going to be instrumental in our work moving forward. Yeah, no, that's great. And I mean, I've prepared some slides, but I mean, my ultimate goal is to be as useful as possible. So if at any point you have any questions, just scream or raise your hand and uh, um, great. that's completely fine. Yeah, so James, if you could have someone give me the uh, presenting ability. Nellie, do you have the, uh, can you do that? That's I fast. just did. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let me put these slides up. Um, Right, can you all see that? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, uh, James, thanks for the kind introduction. And uh, I have to say it is, uh, it's great to be back in, uh, <laughs> in Vermont. You know, as James mentioned, I spent a, a fair amount of time there between 2014 and 2016 uh, doing some work for the state and uh, on numerous phone calls uh, with a lot of folks there, just kind of helping people think through uh, some of the various different options. Because as you all know, if, when you're considering alternatives uh, to uh, prohibiting cannabis supply, you've got a lot of choices. And I think Vermont ultimately implemented a very cautious approach that allowed for some flexibility. I mean, I just, I was thinking about that if, uh, if, if Vermont had started with a commercial regime 2016, 2017, and kind of um, the, the discussions we would be having about social equity would be quite different. And, uh, so what I want to do uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, but as I said, please feel free to interrupt at any time, um, is first of all, just to provide a framework for thinking about cannabis policy and social equity. And, uh, and, and, and an important piece to this is recognizing that when we talk about social equity, health equity has to be a piece to that as well. And that's something, there are other frameworks out there, it doesn't get as much attention, but that's something you're going to want to think about as well. And then I also want to, at the end, kind of highlight seven different trade-offs or puzzles. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of choices you're going to confront. There are going to be pros and cons. And uh, there's some that we've identified um, by kind of looking at places that have already kind of started to, um, you know, take social equity and kind of policy seriously. And then some are a little bit more theoretical, but things that uh, you may want to consider. Um, now, the insights here are based on uh, primarily on three different journal articles. Um, if any of you, I'm more than happy to send them. For those of you who haven't seen them, I'm more than happy to send them. Um, my email is kilmer at rand.org. And uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, we've been doing a lot more work kind of in this space. And, uh, and I'm thankful for that. I'm really happy to see how social equity has really kind of come to the forefront, you know, because it wasn't really there at the beginning, you know, when... Washington and Colorado, you know, passed legalization in 2012. You know, to the extent that equity was even discussed, it was largely about reducing arrest uh, inequities as well as incarceration. Although most of the people that are, uh, um, you know, that were um, justice involved, you know, weren't necessarily uh, spending time behind bars. Um, but anyways, that's kind of where the early discussions were. But then over time, you saw other states. Uh, really begin to embrace this idea of expunging previous uh, cannabis offenses or sealing them, depending on the state. And then even within that, you know, early on, it would they would still kind of put the onus on the individual to go and have to petition the courts. And then you saw some places kind of uh, take that a step further and actually begin to go down the process of automatically expunging some of these offenses. And then also, you know, especially in the past couple of years, there's been an increased focus on, you know, trying to give entrepreneurship and employment opportunities to those from dis um, uh, di uh, disproportionately affected communities. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then also how you can potentially use cannabis tax revenues to address uh, some of these inequities. So the, the conversation really has evolved. And like I said, if, if Vermont would have allowed commercialization 2016, 2017, you know, as I said, this social equity conversation would be very different given probably the power that uh, the existing companies would have already had. Um, but of course, you know, the big question is, well, who should benefit from these equity initiatives? You know, is it just those who are arrested or convicted for possession? Are you going to allow, uh, you know, those with uh, uh, records for kind of maybe, you know, small time dealing sales? Um, 
you know, will it be people who live in communities that were disproportionately affected by cannabis laws? And if so, how is this going to be defined by zip code, police district? Uh, those decisions matter quite a bit. Um, or, you know, should the beneficiaries maybe be some individuals um, who are confronting social inequities, but that may have nothing to do with cannabis laws? So there's a lot of options you have here. And depending on the population you're trying to focus on, that ultimately, I think, should determine kind of which lever policy levers you use. So as I said, look, there are a number of um, kind of different frameworks out there to help decision makers think about this. And so we kind of looked at what was already published in the literature, and then we talked to a number of different regulators. And so I'm thrilled that um, you're going to be hearing from Shalene Title next. She was extremely helpful uh, in terms of helping us kind of think through some of these issues. Um, but we ultimately came up with this framework in terms of thinking about the policy choices that fall into kind of six different categories, you know, arrests and penalties, addressing previous cannabis offenses, decisions about licensing, uh, fostering diversity in the cannabis workforce, uh, what to do with government revenues, and then also health. So I'm going to quickly kind of walk through those uh, before kind of getting to some of the different uh, puzzles and trade-offs. Um, so obviously, Look, I mean, with legalization, you're going to be reducing arrests and convictions. Um, I mean, to the extent that Vermont already decriminalized, you may not see as big of an effect as you see as you may have seen in some other places. But you know, it's not going to eliminate all police contacts. So there's important questions um, that remain about well, what are the consequences going to be for those who are arrested and convicted for you know underage uh, use, uh, public consumption, uh, driving under the influence? Depending on the choices you make there that also could have important implications uh, for uh, social equity. And then also there's a question about, well, what's gonna happen to the illegal market? Look, I mean, we've seen this, it takes time to significantly reduce the size of the illegal market um, after you legalize. I mean, you're not gonna shut it down overnight. And, uh, but one of the questions confronting jurisdictions is, is, okay, as you move to this more regulated environment, are you gonna step up efforts to try to shut down or reduce the or try to reduce the size of the illegal market to move people toward uh, uh, the uh, the regulated um, uh, uh, stores, and there could be potential. And we'll talk about this later on, but there could be potential equity implications with that as well, depending on well, what does target enforcement look like? Is this going to be you know applying criminal uh, sanctions, or will, will this be done more like through code violations or civil violations? The decisions you make about, if you decide to to go after, try to reduce the size of the illegal market, um, the decisions uh, about whether, especially criminal versus civil, could have important implications um, for social equity. But a lot of that also depends on the, the characteristics of those who are already participating in the illegal market. And uh, as you know, um, that varies uh, quite a bit depending on kind of what state and what uh, kind of county you're in or jurisdiction. Also, this idea of addressing previous cannabis offenses. Um, we we recently did some work uh, for the state of uh, Virginia or Commonwealth of Virginia, helping them think through this. And we found kind of looking at their uh, uh, criminal justice data, we found that if, uh, you know, if you're just even expunging kind of simple cannabis possession offenses, um, that's going to affect many more people that then could be affected um, by giving them employment or uh, entrepreneurship opportunities. I mean, it was like the order it was twice the order of magnitude. I mean, it, it was large. I mean, granted, it, it could be a bit different there, and those aren't mutually exclusive. Um, but uh, this is something to think through. And of course, you know, as I read before, you know, which offenses are going to be eligible? And I think the big question is, is what are you going to do with those that were convicted for kind of low level sales? Most places allow, you know, when, when they are doing expunging and sealing, you know, they are allowing for possession offenses. There is a fair amount of variation, though, in terms of the amount you could have had. And uh, they're, they're all and, and I realize that I think in New York, one of the things they're trying to grapple with is trying to go back through the criminal records to see how much information there is about the total weight that may have been seized uh, during a um uh, uh, during a, a justice-involved transaction. Um, but the, the big question is, is this going to be automatic or is the onus going to be put on the individuals? Obviously, if you, put the, if you put the onus on the individuals, you know, depending on the jurisdiction, you know, it, it, it takes time and effort. You know, in some places, you may have to hire a lawyer, and that creates barriers. Whereas if it's automatic, that makes it a heck of a lot easier. And so you, we've seen some more states kind of moving in the automatic direction. And... Uh, 
and you know it, it's been a while since I've uh, I've worked with the the criminal justice data in uh, in Vermont. But you know, states there's a lot of variation in in kind of the the IT systems that states have, and so in some places it can be a lot easier uh, to kind of automatically expunge. I'm not sure what the situation is in Vermont, but that's something you kind of have to keep in mind. And fortunately, there are a number of uh, even nonprofit organizations, for example, Code for America, and there's some others that have been you know that have been working with different states to kind of help them write the code to expunge, to make it easier to expunge or steal offenses, not just for cannabis, but uh, that may be something uh, um, the state of Vermont may want to uh, uh, think about. So licensing, this is a big one. And even stepping back, not even necessarily thinking about social equity, you know, deciding who gets to sell or supply and how much has uh, is one of the biggest decisions you're gonna confront. Uh, because at the end of the day, if you end up giving out too many licenses, um, that's going to you know, increase competition, and it's really going to push profits down. And so especially if you're thinking about social equity and, and, trying to make, and trying to build wealth in certain communities, if you give out too many licenses, it's going to make it even harder for some to make profits. And uh, so, I mean, I think the example here is Oregon. Oregon gave out way too many licenses, and uh, I think there are various reasons for doing that. But realize there are implications there. Um, also, you know, the big question uh, you're going to confront is, you know, will there be preferences for licenses or employment in the industry? And if so, which populations are you going to target there? Um, I, I think you'll probably hear from Shalene later on about, you know, you know, will there be requirements for a binding equity plan? And also, are there going to be supports? built in to kind of you know potentially help individuals that are in that, um, in disproportionately affected communities in terms of um, making it easier for them to apply maybe you know having fee waivers or providing training so there's a lot of decisions here but that first bullet is really important and this is you know this is somebody I talked to James about a while ago I mean I I mean I, I think it'll be useful and I, and I think you recently have had someone kind of estimate the size of the market so I, I think based on that, and then thinking about well, how much you know, how many tourists do you want to supply? Um, using that as a gauge for beginning to think about how many you know, how many you know, how much production you want to allow. Then once you have that, then you can decide how much how much of it you want to go to small, medium versus large growers. Um, that's going to be important. If you just kind of go about just giving out licenses, um, you know, pretty much to to a lot of people who apply, that's going to have big implications, not only for social equity but also our, arguably for public health. Um, so fostering diversity in the cannabis workforce, um, this is something, so this is not necessarily thinking about entrepreneurship, but this is actually getting, um, individuals, uh, from disproportionately affected communities kind of working in the industry. So obviously the questions about, you know, will there be recruitment and training efforts in these communities? Um, we know kind of outside of the cannabis world that BIPOC owned uh, businesses are more likely to hire BIPOC employees. So that's also something to kind of keep in mind when you think about licensing. And, you know, and depending on the state, you know, states have various laws um, with respect to affirmative action. Another, if one of your goals is to increase diversity in the campus workforce, another option is potentially having some government stores, you know, where you could have a, a smaller jurisdiction or it could actually be a state agency kind of running it and then potentially using affirmative action. Now, as I said, I'm not, it's been a while since I've gone through Vermont law and definitely not with respect to affirmative action policy. So I don't know if this is something that could actually apply there. Um, but that is an option that a lot of places uh, have overlooked. We'll talk a little bit more about government stores later on. Um, what are you going to do with government revenues? I mean, this you could you know potentially use it to fund reparations or restorative justice efforts. I'm sure some of you are aware of an, uh, Evanston, Illinois. Um, they're using some of their cannabis tax revenues uh, for um, reparations uh, for black Americans. And so um, they recently just announced the details of that. And I think initially the money is going to go to help uh, um, um, help individuals, especially in the realm of housing. I don't know if it's for remodels or helping with mortgage payments, um, but it's very much kind of targeted toward housing. I mean, there are a lot of options there. Uh, but they've they've made the decision that that's where they're going to put some of their cannabis tax revenues, and so that is an option. Also, you know, in, as we talk about, you need to be thinking about health equity as well. So, are you going to be putting money into health services or programs in disproportionately affected communities? And then also, you know, another you know, another option is to you know use some of those government those tax revenues to fund training and grant programs. Um, 
And, uh, and as I said, yeah, Shaleen's going to have a number of insights on uh, on what works there and what doesn't. Um, finally, health. Um, you know, this is not when we think about licensing. It's not just in terms about how many production licenses you're going to give out, but also deciding on you know the number of stores and where they're going to locate. Uh, this is important. Um, we we know. There's a growing uh, body of literature suggesting that cannabis stores are concentrating in minority communities and places with high levels of deprivation. And there's some evidence suggesting that, you know, the closer you live to a cannabis store, uh, it's associated with more frequent use. Now, I've got to say, we have to be careful here because it could just be the case that the stores are smart and the stores are just located in places where there's a higher number of cannabis users. So these two studies and that second one is one I'm a, a co-author on. I mean, it's very much about the association, but and I'm hoping that eventually there's going to be kind of more rigorous research on this, really trying to tease out how much of it is because the store is there versus just that the store is located there because of high rates of cannabis use. Um, but this is something that I have to think about. And also in terms of thinking about health, the products that are allowed could affect health equity. And I'm more than happy in the Q&A session to talk about what, what the research, the overall research says about legalization of public health. But I do want to spend just a little bit of time talking about cannabis potency in health. And, you know, there's a, there are more studies are coming out on this. And I've got to say, you know, a lot of the measures they're using are pretty crude. You know, sometimes a lot of times people don't know how much they're consuming. What they're using in these studies are, um, are, are, are pretty crude measures. So it makes it hard to kind of precisely know what's going on. And we also know that, you know, these, the higher THC products can be more efficient, you know, especially for those with some um, medical conditions. Um, that said, when, and then I suspect, you know, especially as a, um, a, a, a as a board, you're going to be having more discussions about products. And at the end of the day, we actually need to know more about titration. That is, you know, say, for example, when, when it was 5% THC and someone needs to smoke a whole joint, you know, well, when it's 15% THC, do they only smoke a third? Right. It could be once again, just uh, even for those using for non-medical purposes, it just could be more efficient. Um, there's not a lot of research on that, you know, done here in the United States. A couple studies in Europe. Um, but there are two new reviews of kind of this emerging research that suggest that we need to take some of these potential risks seriously. So there was one um, uh, working group out of Washington state that found that the THC content of cannabis products contributes to adverse health effects and that dose response matter when it was particularly concerning for young users and those that already had uh, kind of pre-existing mental health conditions. And they were worried that it could disproportionately affect uh, individuals in low income and uh, minority communities. And uh, right before that, there was also another review of this work, um, you know, from some folks in Colorado. And they found that the evidence is moderate to strong concerning THC concentration and the association with the mental health effects. Um, but in terms of the specific THC content for products, they said, you know, the evidence is insufficient when examining, you know, does it increase, in, does it lead to an increase in dependence or acute health harms? Um, you know, absence of evidence isn't the same as evidence of absence, right? I mean, this it's just that this is an emerging field, and I, I think researchers are still trying to get a good handle on trying to measure consumption. But this is something that, you, you know, um, that as a regulatory board that you're going to want to uh, pay attention to. And um, so that. That said, um, uh, you know, in the process of doing this, there are kind of a number of different things that you're going to have to consider and uh, we'll kind of label these in terms of kind of puzzles and trade-offs. And, you know, and obviously the first one is if your target group or the area you're focusing on is too large, not only does that mean that it's going to be fewer resources for each of those individuals, but you run the risk of helping those who don't need it. And... Um, when we were doing some of the research on this, we were talking to folks in, in Seattle, and gentrification is an issue. If you say people from these particular neighborhoods, you know, you know, should be uh, given preferences for licenses, if you've got gentrification happening, it, you could have people who actually live in those communities that could be get this preferential license, you know, preferential treatment, but at the end of the day, weren't necessarily the folks that you were trying to target uh, in terms of helping with social equity, and uh, and we've seen this. Um, in Los Angeles, I forget how they, I, for, I don't know if they used, um, I, I forget what they initially started with in terms of the geographic area, um, but they soon realized that they had to narrow that down uh, considerably. So I think they've narrowed it down to police districts. Um, so uh, so this is something to keep in mind. I think, I think it's easier to start very narrow and then expand as opposed to being very expansive early on and then trying to um, um, 
kind of trying to, uh, um, you know, get, you know, refine and, and get to smaller areas. Um, a second issue is that, you know, defining beneficiaries by race or ethnicity can lead to legal challenges. Um, you know, we talked to regulators, I'm sure, I'm sure you have as well, in other states that, you know, while, you know, while for their social equity programs, they really are trying to focus on helping um, uh, individuals um, uh, from uh, BIPOC communities. At the same time, they're afraid that if they actually kind of, you know, specifically mention that, that it could open them up to legal challenges. And, you know, some states have, have treated this differently, but, you know, we saw this happen in Ohio a couple times uh, with respect to their medical program. And uh, there have been a few lawsuits kind of challenging their uh, um, their equity efforts, and those effort and those lawsuits were successful. Um, and so, uh, but on the other hand, you know, you know, de you know, depending on your willingness, you may be, you know, you may be willing to look if you think this is the right thing, you may be willing to um, deal with those legal challenges. But that is something you, that you want to think about. And uh, you know, a third piece to this is that, you know, increased enforcement against the illegal market could help the equi equity licensees, right? You know, especially in terms of, um, you know, you know, trying to move people from the illegal market to the legal market. Um, but as I you know, mentioned before, there's a, there's a potential trade-off there. And, you know, how what, what does increased enforcement look like? And could that actually end up uh, uh, exacerbating some... Uh, uh, inequities, and it may be the case that it does, but overall, on um, you know, on net, it still may be worth it to do it. But this is something um, that you're going to want to think through, um, and, it, and a lot of it will depend on the characteristics of those who are participating uh, currently in the uh, illegal market. Um, fourth one is to realize that legalization could reduce total employment in the cannabis industry. I mean, you hear these numbers about that, you know, there's so many people that, you know, that, that cannabis legalization has increased jobs. But in a lot of cases, it's just moved jobs. <laughs> it's moved jobs from the illegal market to the legal market. Obviously, there are payroll taxes. There's there's other implications with it being legal. Um, but in terms of the total number of people who are employed in this market, um, we, we're gonna, we expect over time legalization is going to reduce that. Legalization, I mean, especially in um, uh, the more commercial markets, it's just so much more efficient to be having these you know with these huge grows. And uh, and you just don't need as many employees. So I, I just would be careful when you hear people say, "Oh, we're going to increase the, the the amount of the number of jobs and the number of individuals uh, from BIPOC communities who are in those jobs." That may not be the case. They're going to be legal. There'll be legal jobs, but in terms of money, people um, um, money that people are bringing in um, or, or, or income, it's not necessarily the case. So this is something to kind of think about as well. Um, you know, and also increasing the number of licenses in an in area, you know, as I mentioned before, it could, you know, to push down prices, to push down profits, as well as increase the availability of cannabis in that community. And that's why there's concern about, uh, you know, the emerging evidence suggesting that, uh, you know, these stores are located in um, in minority communities and places with higher levels of deprivation. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, this is something you can address. You can decide. Um, not only the number of stores, but also in terms of the density, that 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 is a choice that you have. Um, but this is something, especially when you begin thinking about health equity. Um, you know, we 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 saw this with the liquor stores, right? In a number of places, you know, we saw liquor stores also concentrating in these communities, leading to a number of negative effects. Now, of course, alcohol and cannabis have very different harm profiles, and I think the evidence is still out. Um, or the jury's still out with respect to whether or not alcohol and uh, uh, and, and cannabis are complements or substitutes. I mean, a lot depends on kind of what population you're talking about. But this is something to think about in terms of the number of licenses, but also the density of the licenses for the retail outlets. And also, when you're planning this, and I think you're, I think you know, after talking to uh, James and others about this, I mean, I think this is. This is where you know you can really begin thinking about okay as we design this pr program and we think about the potential benefits you need to think about what's going to happen with federal legalization and you know obviously federal legalization would reduce some cannabis uh, arrests although i mean most of the action when it happens when we think about cannabis arrest i mean most of that's happening at the same local level um but it can actually put a lot of your equity licenses uh, out of business and so, you know, when you talk to people that are in the industry, I mean, obviously, they're, they're, they complain about the federal prohibition, and rightfully so. It makes it harder to do banking, harder to get financing, 
and their, their tax implications. Um, but what you don't hear from a lot of folks is many of them are actually able to still stay in business uh, because of the federal prohibition. And, um, and we had estimated a while ago, we just updated this, but it's still the case that you can produce all of the THC that's consumed in the United States on a few dozen big farms. That's it. So with federal legalization, you know, that can federal legalization could look a lot of different ways. Um, but if, you know, if, if it's no longer pro, uh, if it's no longer prohibited to move uh, cannabis products across state lines, you could see the industry uh, concentrating very quickly. And so when you think about jobs and kind of your small entrepreneurs, your small growers, if you have this all concentrated in one part of the country and, and with a uh, and, you know, increasing returns to scale, um, this can make it a lot harder for these smaller businesses ultimately to compete. And uh, and as I said, we don't know, you know, when or, you know, or, or if, but I mean, it sure seems like we're heading in that direction, um, um, you know, what federal legalization will look like. Um, but, uh, you know, there's also, you know, who knows in terms of um, whether or not imports would be allowed, but, you know, it, you know, it would also be, um, you know, in a lot of cases, a lot cheaper to grow the cannabis offshore, extract out the THC, CBD, other components, and then move that back up, um, which would have really important implications for the uh, the smaller growers. And then also the big question is, is if there is federal legalization, and I've actually seen a couple stories about this recently, but this is something we've been thinking about for a while, if Amazon is allowed to distribute, what that's going to mean for your smaller entrepreneurs. So this is something to kind of keep in mind when you're thinking about designing these regimes, because, you know, you, you give license preferences, you get people in the market, but then if they end up going out of business, it could have been the case that if they would have spent that time, effort, and money on a different industry, they may have ended up doing better. So this is something that, a, a tr an important trade-off that you're going to have to think through. And, and finally, you know, compared to the profit-maximizing approach that we see in most places in the U.S., you know, a state store model could generate more government revenue uh, to address inequities. And also, kind of based on what we saw with alcohol and government control, you, you have fewer public health harms. And so this is, you know, whereas in the current regime, you've got the profits going mostly to white males. Um, you know, with a government store model, though, that money then stays in with the state. And then you, and if you spend it correctly, you could use it really to try to address inequities in these disproportionately affected communities. Now, I don't know if that if there's an option for that within um, with what you're discussing in Vermont, if, if, if it's possible for a small jurisdiction to have a, uh, you know, to kind of have a government uh, owned store. Um, but it's, it's definitely something if you care about social equity and you care about public health, this is something that should at least be discussed. Um, you know, early on when when people were talking about kind of the uh, the state store approach, there was a lot of concern about, well, what's the what would the federal government do? Right. The, uh, um, you know, the state, in order, if the state was doing that, they essentially would be ordering their employees to violate federal law. And but I think over time, you know, that concern um, isn't as salient. I mean, what we now have four, more than 40 percent of the U.S. population lives in states that have passed laws uh, to allow uh, commercial production and retail sales. And, uh, you know, I think there was some nervousness at the beginning of the Trump administration. No one was quite sure what the um, his Department of Justice was going to do, but even though they rescinded the Coleman, uh, the Cole memoranda, or memorandum, it really, you know, for all intents and purposes, it didn't change things. So I think that that's less of a concern now. Um, but it, but it's something that I think that jurisdictions should be thinking about. I mean, there are pros and cons, but it's, uh, uh, but but if you're if you care about public health, you care about uh, uh, social equity. Um, this uh, th this is something worth considering. So final thoughts. Uh, look, there are a lot of uh, kind of outcomes that, as you know, that get discussed in legalization debates. Uh, social equity is just one of them, um, but it's becoming more prominent and I'm happy to see that. I, I, I think this is, this, is, this is an important piece uh, right, right next to um, some of the other outcomes. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's not controversial to say that we wanna reduce inequities in most circles, um, but the trade-offs here are gonna make these, some of these decisions a lot harder. And I think ideally, and this seems like something where Vermont are in a kind of a sweet spot for, is really thinking about okay, if these are, you know, what are the, if, if these are the different groups or communities that we really want to try to benefit uh, with legalization, 
you know, then beginning to kind of run the numbers, like, okay, if we do this approach, we think it could help, the, you know, we could, it could help build wealth by this amount. If we take this approach, you know, it could build wealth by this amount. I mean, I think, I, I, I think that's one of the things that's been missing so far from these equity discussions is actually just kind of running the numbers and saying, okay, if my goal is to help this particular population, what, what are, what's going to be the most effective uh, approach? Uh, you know, is it giving out license preferences? Is it doing something more on trying to increase employment opportunities? You know, will it be just, you know, with respect to expungement? Um, there, there's a lot of choices here. And the final point I want to make is, at, even as you're kind of going through this process, anticipate the need for mid-course corrections. No one's going to get that. No one has gotten this right. And even in some of the places that have taken this seriously, Los Angeles, Massachusetts, uh, Illinois had great intentions. They've had to make big changes or they've had to make significant changes. So I think as you're developing these kind of regulations, uh, thinking through or uh, make, making it easier to make these mid-course corrections, I think is going to be really important because you're, you're likely going to run into things that you weren't planning on. And, uh, um, and, and to the extent that social equity is a goal, I think you're, you're going to have to make some of these uh, adjustments. So with that, I will close. And James, and I'm really, thank you so much for the opportunity. And you know, I look forward to answering any questions you may have. And you know, and if I don't know the answer, um, I definitely will do my best to try to point you in the right direction to the person who may have it. So, <laughs> thank you so, much. Yeah. So, yeah, Julie, could you just, just kind of manage the question, question process? Sure. Um, if it's okay with you, I'll ask the first question since you offered. <laughs> since you oh, offered yeah. your pepper. Um, can you go back, Bo, and talk a little bit about the health impacts? of um, the concentration of stores. I know that you um, addressed this in one of the papers that you wrote about um, the concentration of stores and then use in that area and then the subsequent health effects. Can you, I know you touched on it a little bit, but can you talk about that a little bit more? And then I'm also curious about, you know, a concentration of stores and then the impacts on youth in that particular area. Yeah, so as I said, this is, so there, there are a number of studies now which kind of document that where cannabis retail stores are opening, you, we saw this with medical, we're seeing this in, in, with non-medical as well, um, that they are um, concentrating in uh, BIPOC as well as, uh, BIPOC communities as well as places with higher levels of deprivation. There are all these different indices. Now, in terms of the health effects, there isn't a lot out there. I mean, people are just, I mean, it, it takes a while to kind of get these data. So there have been a couple studies which have looked at this and they found that you know people that live closer to where stores open up end up having more end up uh, using more frequently. That first study focused largely um, the Evans. I think it was by Julia Dilley and Evans. The first one I had listed there that was focused on adults in Oregon, and so what I don't think it was focused on youth at all. The second paper, which I was a part of, was looking at stores both licensed and unlicensed in Los Angeles. It was focused on young adults. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, I mean, so it's not adolescents, but it's not necessarily kind of all adults finding that those who live closer to stores were more, um, uh, were more likely to be um, reusing more frequently. And that actually was nice because we've been following, or my colleagues have been following this group of about 2,500 young adults. I mean, they started, I think, when they were 13 in Los Angeles, following them for about 10 years. So they were able to control for a lot of factors. Um, but as I said, we have to be really careful with these studies because they're not based on, they're not using any type of kind of real kind of quasi experimental design. And so it was hard to rule out, well, was it because the store was there that people were more likely to use or were the stores just smart and, you know, the, the, the proprietors. So, so I mean, I look at that and but it's cons but you know it's it's consistent with you know some other literatures we have with alcohol and tobacco, um, but uh, but I mean I I definitely would consider this an emerging area and so far though they're really just focused on um, you know the the frequency of use not necessarily kind of other health harms right I mean that's the other thing as I'm sure most of a lot of you have run into you know so much of the research especially on the health consequences you know so much of it focuses on well, did legalization affect whether or not someone consumed cannabis in the past month? Well, from a health perspective, we don't really care as much about that as we do, you know, kind of more frequent use, the types of products that are consumed, um, you know, whether or not someone's meeting criteria for cannabis use disorder. But part of that was just the nature of the data. You know, I, I, I don't think the researchers always want to rely on that, but that's what data were available. 
And so one of the things that I, I have been seeing a change in is beginning to change some of these survey instruments so we can get better information. Um, not only on, on how frequently people are using, what they're using, but you are seeing people then try to get more information on you know the different health outcomes as well. Um, but uh, so I know that may not be entirely satisfying, um, but uh, but yeah, look, I mean, there's a, there there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of researchers kind of in this space now. I, I got to say, back back in the early days when I was spending time in Vermont, there there were a lot of drug policy researchers or people kind of looking at this. But now with it, there's been so much policy change, it actually for re, you know you actually can begin to kind of do some more thorough evaluation. So there's a, there's a lot of people kind of working in the space, which is encouraging, but. Uh, yeah, so so we don't have, but in terms of kind of other health consequences, you know, for example, does you know if, if stores open, how does that uh, affect driving under the influence? Like that's something I'm really interested in, um, and especially when people talk about so, you know kind of uh, uh, consumption rooms, right, or like social consumption. Like essentially, we have cannabis clubs and they're like bars, but essentially people are using cannabis. You know, what does that mean for impaired driving? I you know, Stephanie, I really don't know. Um, you know, because on one hand, you know, if, if people are going to the cannabis, uh, the, you know, the cannabis club, you know, smoking a couple of joints, then going to a bar, you know, we know that the interaction between alcohol and cannabis is, uh, you know, can really increase the risk of getting into an accident. But if people are, instead of going to the bar and having, you know, having a bunch of drinks, are then going to the cannabis club, that may actually, from when you think about impaired driving, that actually may be a net win. So it's actually interesting. So, uh, so that's one of the things, kind of, as a commission, as you're kind of looking at the research on this, I would focus on, especially with impaired driving, focus on the studies that look at the total number of crashes or the total number of accidents, as opposed to those that are believed to be linked to cannabis. Because first of all, it's, it's how, as we know, THC is it, it can be hard to measure the THC, and then even when you do, it's not necessarily correlated with impairment. And so, and when you and when you only focus on studies that look at whether or not THC was involved, you you're you're omitting kind of this bigger picture in terms of what what, what are the potential you know trade-offs in terms of like substitutes and, and complements with alcohol and other drugs. So that's why I think the better research in this area is um, is that are those studies that focus, like I said, on the total measures. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Nader has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I just have uh, two quick questions, if it's okay. Um, and I think the first one was partially answered, I think. Um, but relating to licensing, um, I was wondering if you could provide any direction as to how uh, we could measure how many stores or how many licenses in an area are too many licenses and what metrics we would use to quantify that in the future. That's a great question. And I, I think it's one that not a lot of people are asking or even if you were attempting to answer. Um, and I, I guess what I would do is, oh, I'm sorry, I got knocked off there for a second. Can you can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, James, I feel like, didn't, didn't you recently have someone kind of do an estimate on consumption? In the state, we had, a, uh, we had uh, Vincente Cedarberg do uh, a market analysis in August of 2020. Okay, and did they break it down? Did they just come up with state totals, or did they break it down kind of by they different uh, counties? By, by like neighboring states that would come, you know, residents of New York and Mass or New York mm -hmm. and I guess Rhode Island and others that would come to visit us. They broke it down by people that are coming strictly uh, as tourists that might also um, purchase, um, you know. So, okay. th so it's not totally up to date. It probably needs some updating based on New York and New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's going to be that, that's a whole separate issue we could talk about. But so I think what I would do is, to the extent, again, to what Nada was asking about, I think the first thing I would do is, if you got a state level estimate, just just even among state residents. And trying to kind of break that down, and so kind of looking at uh, whether by, by county or something like trying to get uh, uh, the number of people who use, or actually, in the, you, you actually want kind of the total amount consumed, you know, for example, by city or by county, and uh, and then whew, in terms of thinking about, okay, so how many stores to allow? Um, I guess 
I mean, one thing I, I mean, one, one thing I would do is at that point begin to, you know, either you or have someone begin to look at kind of well, what this is where I think we might be able to learn from other jurisdictions in terms of what they've done. And I know there's a fair amount of variation. So Julia Dilley, who's a researcher up in Washington, does a lot of work on cannabis legalization in Washington and Oregon. And she actually, um, she's got this slide where she shows the number of stores per capita, and it's just by state. And you see that in Washington state, it was much lower than it was in Oregon. Um, so um, so I, I, would, I, I would initially start there. Um, and, and then also, and, and, and this is where I, I would start kind of by looking at other places, but then also I think this is where you need to build in the flexibility, right? So um, I, I mean, my, my preference, or I, I would start small. I would give out a small number of licenses, kind of see how that goes. And if it's obvious that, you know, that maybe another store needs to open up, um, it's a lot easier to kind of do it that way as opposed to if you just give a bunch of licenses out and then decide later on, oh, wait, that was too many. It, then it's a lot harder to try to rein that back in. So not, I know that may not be entirely satisfying, but initially getting a good sense of kind of local market conditions and then also beginning to look at what other states have been doing in this space and then kind of taking that, making some decisions and then starting small. I mean, that seems like the most kind of risk averse approach. That definitely helps. Thank you. Um, and I, I just had one more question that was a bit more general. Uh, you mentioned at the end uh, mid-course corrections, and you know, obviously Vermont is quite different from places like Los Angeles and Seattle. Um, I was wondering if you have any input on what potential mid-course corrections we might expect down the road. Yeah, I mean, part of it depends on you know. Um, kind of how you start off, like, for example, as I mentioned, like, for, you know, for example, Los Angeles, in terms of when they were defining disproportionately affected communities, I don't know, they may have started at the zip code level and then realized that by doing it that way, they, you know, you end up helping a lot of people that weren't necessarily the targets of the social equity program. So then they, then they moved down to, I think, police district. But then also, I think there was a recent change where then in order to get an equity license, you had to have a previous arrest in the, you know, for cannabis, which, which wasn't, um, which was one of the criteria before, but then they kind of narrowed that down. So narrowed down geographic areas. Then they also narrowed down kind of the populations. And you'll talk to Celine here in a little bit. I mean, what they ended up doing in uh, uh, Massachusetts was I think they ended up deciding that when they were going to give out the licenses for delivery and maybe something else, that they were initially going to limit all of those just to equity applicants, where they have, I think it's social equity and economic empowerment applicants there, um, which wasn't something that was initially. So I, so I definitely think, um, I mean, at the end of the day, it really gets down to which populations are you trying to help? And, and then, you know, and, and then I say, based on that, you know, is it anyone that's had a cannabis arrest or a cannabis conviction in the past? Is it those who live in communities where there have been a disproportionate number of arrests compared to other parts of the state? Um, I think once you, once you kind of figure that out, um, that in theory, I mean, look, Paul, I understand politics and all that stuff, but, you know, stepping back, identifying the population you want to help. I think is going to be the first step. And then once you have that population defined, then you can look at all these different levers that I talked about. And I'm sure Shalene will tell you about some others. Um, and then kind of pick up, okay, if my goal is to help this population the most, these three levers will probably be the best. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I guess the, the other thing, Nader, I would say is, you know, and I don't know how much power the, the commission has in terms of helping to allocate tax revenues. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but anyway, so that's, that's potentially important because if it turns out that you realize that, Hey, look, one of the best approaches is going to be taking our cannabis tax revenues and putting it into using some of that money into, in, and putting it into, uh, efforts in communities to help build wealth. I mean, it, you may be putting that money into programs that have nothing to do with cannabis, um, right. In terms of kind of building wealth in some of these communities, but 
you know, a lot of that's going to depend on, well, you know, can you get the resources there? You know, and that's and that's where, you know, the the the, the, the politics gets involved. Yeah. Pepper. Um, so I have a question that's related, but I actually would like to defer to Susanna if she has one. We invited her here and she's going to be very instrumental in our um, piece. So Susanna, if you have a question, just because we're short on time. I'm okay for now. Thank you. And thank you, brother. This was really informative. Yeah, no, and Susanna, as, and for all of you, if at any point after this you have any questions, just feel free to shoot me an email. Like I said, I'd be more than happy to answer if I can, if not, point you in the direction of someone maybe in another state who's been kind of dealing with some of those issues. So, so Bo, I've, my question follows up on what we were just talking about. Um, you know, Julie reminded us earlier today that uh, today is the uh, actual anniversary of former President Nixon declaring the war on drugs 50 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but it, it does tie into this question about historically impacted areas and policing districts, free and re reduced price lunching, and where we can find that data. And um, if the if it is if there are is good data dating back 50 years, and um, you know a lot of the people that were born that might be seeking licenses now, you know the, their neighborhoods have changed. You know where they grew up has changed. And then um, also just you know we've been hearing a lot about potentially prioritizing Vermont applicants. There is actually some language in the in Act 164, our enabling legislation, that gives some priority to Vermont applicants. It gives them some technical assistance. But, you know, like uh, for us um, as a board, you know, in Vermont, we've we've decriminalized um, cannabis uh, maybe a decade ago, and we've really stopped enforcement. So we're not going to see a lot of those cannabis convictions here in Vermont that we might see from out-of-state applicants and we don't want to be um you know we're i'm not suggesting that we would give preference to vermont applicants and you know at the disadvantage of, of people coming from out of state but it does seem like you know these kind of evolution of policy over time or police targeted policing over time um and gentrification as it builds in might really just impact you know if we have a generic definition of high impact area or disproportionately impacted area and it's you know it, it the, it's evolved over the course of the 50 year war on drug then um how do we as a board try to start to kind of define social equity applicant in a way that actually you know <clears throat> brings the people in that we're trying to bring in yeah well that's interesting in terms of, i didn't realize that about out of state licenses so does the commission have the ability to initially limit licenses to Vermont residents? Um, I don't think that's in the statute anywhere. I know that, you know, when I when we were originally working on this uh, in uh, 2015, that was a hot topic of discussion. And I think Colorado had residency requirements of, I think, six months or a year. Um, but I, there's nothing in our legislation that would limit our licenship to Vermont residents. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, as a commission, do you have the ability to make to when you're kind of doing the licensing scoring to to allow that? To allow preference for Vermonters? Yeah. Well, so the one piece where kind of Vermont residents are singled out in our legislation is that we um our agency of community development and um, a few other organizations need to provide technical assistance in the application process to Vermont residents. So they will have some help um, that other folks will not have in actually preparing an application. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that, that's just it's a bit concerning because, you know, the, the issue is, is you get the, the multi state actors. Right, um, you know those those from out of state that got licenses in other places, and you know they're going to be you know and especially once and once they can move product you know if they can eventually move product across state lines, it's going to make it a lot harder for them smaller the smaller entrepreneurs uh, to compete. Um, but but you raise a really interesting question about well when we think about you know because the way that it's been defined in some places is and I know they were talking about this in Vermont I don't know if they ultimately decided on this. Is they looked at uh, cannabis possession, or maybe just yeah, at least cannabis possession arrests, kind of in different, um, you know, in different jurisdictions, kind of over time, 
And then they looked at those that were might have been above the median or, you know, in terms of arrest rates. I think they actually maybe maybe even did it by race as well um, and uh, race ethnicity. And then from there, you know, said, OK, all of these areas that are, you know, in the, you know, in the 75th percentile or higher or, you know, some they had some threshold like that. Then they use that to define it as a disproportionately affected community that they would give preference to. Um, I, I think you're right. I, I think to the extent that Vermont has decriminalized. And so I, 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 so it, it may be useful to go, and I don't know how far back your data, um, the data you have on arrest goes, um, but I mean, I, I definitely think you know doing something you know historically as well. I, I think I think that's something that places haven't thought that much about. But I think you're right. Um, yeah, because just because someone lives in a community now that wouldn't be considered a DAC doesn't mean they weren't, you know, you know, 20 years ago. Um, yeah. But, it, but it, and at the end of the day, it's a lot of this comes down to, you know, how you know, how much you want to address race ethnicity. Like some some of these states, they want to, but they decide just not to mention it at all. They try to use different proxies to try to get at this because they're worried about getting sued. And and rightfully so, we talk, I remember we, we talked to some regulators in a state that they were worried that even if they allowed license preferences based on race, ethnic, even though they had a much larger social equity program, they were worried that even if the, the licensing component was given preferences by race or ethnicity, that that could end up, you know, if there were lawsuits on that, it could shut down their whole equity effort, right. potentially. So they they were very kind of risk averse on this. Um, but you've seen other places, like, you know, Ohio definitely has gone sued. Um, but no, I, I think when you talk to Shalene next, she'll have some thoughts about that as well, because I think Massachusetts had to deal with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yep. Kyle or Susanna, do you have questions? Julie, are, are we running behind schedule? Um, we, I think we planned for Shalene at, at 1.40, okay. um, unless T Nellie tells me that that's incorrect. So I think you could go ahead and ask your question, but that might be the last question. Okay. Well, great to, great to virtually meet you, read a lot of your work, um, and so it's great. Um, I, I guess I had a comment, um, and it's more about a comment that, you know, I think we, we really need to, to drill, and I know you've spent time in Vermont, you know, assessing our market on, on a certain level, and, you know, the, we mentioned that New Jersey and New York coming online is going to change that dynamic a lot, and I think, in consideration of that and looking at some of the questions that were asked earlier about what's a, the right type of a number of establishments um, in a given area, you know, you take an area like like Stowe, which I'm not a resident of Stowe, but I believe there's like 4,000 year long residents of Stowe. And I would imagine that it's one of the higher concentrated tourist areas of the state. So how do we really drill down into a license structure that is equitable and makes sense um, so that there's not too few, too many. For a couple months out of the year when people are really coming uh, to Stowe to ski, so on and so forth. Um, and then my other, well, I guess if you if you have any response to that first, my other my other comment is is something that you had mentioned and it's something that keeps me up at, at night um, from a small cultivator perspective in, in Vermont and in federal legalization and how we can anticipate things kind of ahead of time, not really knowing what federal legalization, if it happens, what it would look like. But I mean, I used to work for agribusiness at the national level in a highly concentrated in, or consolidated industry. And I know that it doesn't help small cultivators and I'm, 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 they are going to be front and center in our marketplace, but I don't want as you kind of alluded to, things to kind of go awry if all the THC consumed in the in the country either is grown overseas or on a few dozen mega farms across the Midwest. Yeah, so getting to your first question, I mean, that's really interesting about seasonality in tourism, right, in terms of the stores. I mean, once again, I would start small. And then, like I said, it'll, it'll be a lot easier for you to, you know, start off with a couple licenses, see how that plays out, um, and then over time add more if you need to. Um, yeah, but that is interesting in terms of what happens in the in the summertime when there may not be as many tourists there. Um, I mean, I guess. Well, I mean, the other interesting thing to think about is is delivery allowed in Vermont? 
No, but we were supposed to make a recommendation about it. Um, we were supposed to do it in April. We'll, we'll be making it in either October or January. Yeah, I mean, the other option in a place like Stowe, where you don't have a lot of uh, full-time residents, would be to have, you know, um, you, as a, one option would be, as opposed to having a lot of stores there, potentially giving stores nearby and other communities the ability to do the deliveries. That's that's one idea. Um, um, but in terms of, but no, Kyle, you're raising this issue that I, that a lot of places are going to be confronting. Like, okay, we want to help these smaller entrepreneurs, especially those that have, you know, come from disproportionately affected communities. All of a sudden we get federal legalization. They're going to they're be potentially hurting. So, I mean, I think, so there's a couple different, I mean, so this gets to this bigger issue of who are you trying to help? Because, you know, it may be that, yeah, you're getting training programs to help people get into the cannabis industry, but some of that money may be better spent helping people get into other uh, potential uh uh, you know industries, and and I think and, and I think being thoughtful about this, um, you know, anticipating that that's going to happen, and what type of support will you know will there be for these smaller entrepreneurs? Is it just hey, let the market decide? Hey, they're out, they're going to lose their their earnings, or will there be support programs to kind of help them? And. Uh, and, and, and also in terms of, you know, and then beginning to think about helping them think about when to get, I mean, look, there's money to be made, especially in the early, in the early years, trying to help people understand when to get out of the market, potentially. Or to sell, you know, yeah. So, so that's why this, I, that's why I think really thinking through the populations, but then this idea of being able to secure some of the tax revenues for, for specific programs I think that's something that's probably a bit more enduring if we imagine a world where there's a lot of commercialization. Um, that said, I don't know if if uh, Vermont if there could be any allowances for kind of county-run stores or state stores, um, but if that's a possibility, it's I think it's something that's worth exploring. There are pros and cons, um, but it, it's a way to secure more money, more revenue for the state that can be used to equity pro for equity programs and uh, um, in other efforts. Well, Thank I feel you. like I could ask you questions all day, Bo, but I, I know we're, we're a little... Yeah, no, no, <laughs> the lead is fantastic. And I know that many of you, I mean, she's been so helpful um, as I've been kind of thinking about these issues. And so I don't want to take away from any of her time. So <laughs> so I want to thank you so much for this opportunity. Like I said, it's great to be back in Vermont. And yeah, reach out if you have any other questions. Um, I want to help out in any way I can. Thank you, Bo. Okay. Thank you. you guys take care. Bye. Shalene, are you here? I think you're here. I'm here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so I think we'll we'll dive right in, Shalene. I um I don't have a prepared introduction for you, although I also don't know where I would start with the resume that you bring to the table in terms of your experience in cannabis regulation and the equity and, and the conversations that you and I have had about them. Um, so I will kind of let you take it away and you know, you can introduce yourself and um and kind of share your your information and knowledge with us great great thank you so much for having me um it's nice to see you all i think i know of all of you <laughs> i've only talked talked to julie before um so i will give you a brief presentation um and then i'm i'm really happy to answer questions i mean i think a lot of it will just be telling you how we did things in massachusetts and letting you customize that um, but I do want to give a big shout out to Vermont in particular. And the reason is um, I've been, since my term ended at the end of last year, I have shifted my focus to federal legalization and particularly worrying about what it's going to do to state programs and state equity programs. And um, one of the things I've been looking at is the model of actually just legalizing possession, just taking possession and limited cultivation out of the Controlled Substances Act and then taking it slow otherwise. And to my knowledge, um, Vermont is the only state to have done that, um, and it's great to have that, that model. So um, I have some slides um, that I asked uh, Nellie to show for me if she could, because I'm scared of sharing my screen and I don't know <laughs> how to do it. Um, and I'll go through um, kind of what the best practices are. Thank you so much, Nelly. So this is um, what we know so far about cannabis and social equity, which is not um, any conclusions, but a lot of good 
information. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce myself. So from 2017 to 2020, I served as commissioner of Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission. We have um, five commissioners. Um, it's an independent agency, and we were appointed based on five different um, expertise areas, I think, I think similar to you all. Um, so mine was uh, social justice. And I'm currently um, a visiting fellow at the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center at The Ohio State University. And I also vice chair the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition, which exists to do um, activities like this and make sure that you know that you are not alone and we are sharing everything that we've learned in other states that have done this first. So um, moving on to the next uh, summary, big picture that we have, um, if we look at what has happened in other states, um, like I said, there's no conclusion, uh, but we've gone a long way since um, five years ago when Massachusetts and California first attempted um, equity. And I just wanna emphasize that we did not get it right the first time. It was a continuous process of listening, changing, figuring out what the challenges were, figuring out what the new challenges were after we had made changes and then addressing them. But best practices are starting to emerge, data is starting to look better. The top three takeaways, I think, are one, um, you can't think of an equity program as a separate thing that you're doing. Um, you have to build the foundation right first or otherwise it will never work. The second thing is that when it comes to what the benefits are, um, what the eligibility is, uh, how you define someone who was harmed by the drug war, um, I think there's no one right answer. I think the right approach to take is to make sure you're listening and that you are being very transparent about it, but it's always going to be different for different states. And then um, of course, like I said, keep uh, planning in advance um, to making adjustments. And I think a part of that is um, being clear, you know, we'll collect data and then in six months, you know, we'll have a listening session. Um, go, I don't know if your statute has you go back regularly um, to discuss or recommend statutory tweaks, but if it does, um, I think you should plan for needing those. Um, and then, of course, uh, you're not alone. All of the other regulators are here to, to talk you through this because it's not easy. So let's start with that foundation. Um, the first thing is making sure that you are understanding um, how big this question is, right? Like regulating cannabis in general uh, is really difficult, but I think this is the most difficult aspect because how can we repair the harm that's done um, by the war on drugs? It, was, it had its, has its tentacles in every single area of our lives. And so we're never going to be able to harm it unless we can do the exact same thing. And there's only so much you can do as a, a cannabis commissioner. So just understand um, your role in it. And I think acknowledging the harm that was done goes a long way. And then listening to people from impacted communities. Um, in the beginning, when I started, the chairman of the commission, who was very different from me, like in pretty much every possible way, we kind of went on a little tour together of disproportionately impacted areas. And we talked to a lot of people um, about just broadly what their, their vision was, you know, how, what do they see as the harm? What do they see as repairing the harm? And I found over time, he and I were very often on the same page um, and, I, and no one else was. And I often look back and think it might've been because of those few days that we spent going on that tour and keeping, keeping up that communication. Um, this is an important bullet point. Um, it's helpful to think about equity in three different ways. The first way is stopping the harm. And I think that is where criminal justice measures are really important, making sure disparities don't continue, um, expungement, um, anything that has to do with the criminal justice system that's usually gonna be out of the scope of you know, business licensing. But I think it's important to acknowledge that piece of it. The second is reinvesting into communities. And that means if you are from a community that was harmed, it doesn't matter if you are interested in the industry or not, you should be getting benefits into your community. Um, and typically in the newer states, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't know how, how this is done in Vermont, but in the newer states, it's usually um, a percentage of revenue, 40, 50, 70% of tax revenue are the most recent figures that are um, directed via grants into disproportionately harmed communities. And then industry benefits. And I think that's what commissions like ours have the most control over 
Um, but it's really important to recognize that that's just um, one piece of equity. So um, on that note, creating a cohesive set of licensing frameworks, social equity programs, and workforce development to ensure meaningful participation. Meaningful participation happens to be the mandate that was in our statute. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about what that means. And in our listening tours, um, our official ones, we heard a lot that there was no one size fits all. Um, some people wanted to be entrepreneurs. Actually, the, the vast majority of people who attended wanted to be entrepreneurs, but a lot of people wanted to be um, managers or move up in the industry or own ancillary businesses. Um, and many wanted to um, just have entry or re-entry programs. So we ended up creating all four of those as separate tracks in our equity program. So after thinking about how to approach it, um, this is a necessary foundational work. And this is, I think, the most key piece that gets missed a lot. Um, and I, I liken it to if your social equity program is trying to help people to cross the bridge, but you have not built the bridge yet, your program is not going to work. So this part is building the bridge. Sequential licensing is extremely important. So I just finished up a project uh, with, with um, the Ohio State University looking at different social equity programs and how they have fared. And I found that the thing that all of them had in common um, that made them not a success is the fact that no matter what was going on with the program that caused the challenges, while they were having challenges, the other bigger, usually established medical operators were able to open. And so a lot of that I think is due to the excellent advice to start small, right? And then go incrementally. And I think that's absolutely the way you should go, but you should start with those marginalized equity businesses first. And that is going to allow you to see the challenges. Um, they are absolutely going to be unforeseen challenges that you'll need to address. And while you are doing that, you won't have other companies that are dominating the industry until it's too late, which is something that we have seen in a lot of places. Which brings me to my next bullet point. Um, we got very lucky in Massachusetts because that's what happened, but we have a strict ownership uh, limit where one person or entity cannot own or control more than three licenses of each type. Um, and it's a lot of investment uh, on the commission to examine those contracts and make sure that there are penalties if you don't, uh, if you try to break the limits. I think that's actually something that's going on in Massachusetts right now. Um, they're having a meeting with some pretty major uh, enforcement penalties. Um, and if you do that, then you have the room to make an equity program that works. Um, guidance for local officials, that is super important because they don't have the time that we have, you know, to spend all the time thinking about this. And so what happens is they go through this uh, default kind of path where it's not intentional racism, but it's systemic that you were likely to go with the company that's going to approach you, that has experience, that has a great um you know, multi-state plan, they're ready to go. And you haven't even thought about equity, right? Because you're this very busy, you know, city level official and you're just trying to do what's right for your residents. Um, and then you find out when it's too late that you haven't been equitable and neither have, you know, the hundreds of other cities. So doing that off the bat is really helpful, even just a model ordinance or um, any kind of guidance that you can give. Conscious staff hiring, really, really important. I think that the first hires that you make is probably the most important decision um, that you'll make in terms of how equity plays out because it's something that you need to think about in every small decision. And, and commissioners can't control for that. You can only hire the right people who are gonna hire the right people who are gonna bake equity into everything you do. And then last, um, this is conceptual, but removing the barriers to entry um, as much as you can is of course going to reduce the capital that is needed and um, in general make it easier for everybody, but um, especially those who are disproportionately advantaged and for whom these barriers are, are more, more um, difficult than others. So you know, trying to make sure that all of your regulations are evidence-based and that um, you're thinking about people who don't have a lot of resources. So that brings us to the big question, um, designing an equity program. So the most common factors um, when you're defining how to uh, identify someone as a disproportionately harmed person 
is arrest and conviction. That's the most direct way. Um, certainly, no matter where they're from or what their life is like, if they've had an arrest or conviction um, from marijuana, it has affected their life. And then residency is also very popular. Um, the imperfect but common standard is uh, to designate, based on arrest records and other um, similar statistics, areas of disproportionate impact geographically. And then if you can prove resident residency in five of the past 10 years, you qualify. So in Massachusetts, we have both of those, as well as if you can show that you have a parent or a spouse that had a drug arrest, then you qualify as an individual. And that gets you into the training programs. Um, and then as a business, if you're majority owned by people who meet that criteria, then you get the business benefits. And then we also have um, less significant benefits if you're 10% or more owned by those people um, so that we can encourage uh, ownership as a type of compensation, but we're also differentiating between those who are majority owned and those who are not. So with the benefits, um, I can say over time, every program that has tried to do this has um, had more drastic benefits being added, being added because we're not seeing it work, right? So it's like every year there is a uh, higher floor for the minimum that you need to do for an equity program. I think the best one so far is Oakland, California. It's very comprehensive. Um, and one thing they've done a great job is legal services, accounting services, other professional services for um, those applicants. Uh, in Oakland and in Boston, a few other cities, um, they have 50% of licenses set aside for people in the program. Um, in Massachusetts at the state level, we don't have any set number of how many businesses there will be. So instead we set aside a license type, um, which is delivery and social consumption. Um, and delivery has been implemented at this point. And our thinking there was that uh, it's the lowest barrier type of license. So for the first three years, um, only if you are one of these designated businesses owned by the people who qualify, you can deliver. And then after three years, we set in advance a list of um, criteria for the commission to determine whether we've met the goals, because chances are it's going to be completely different commissioners at that point. So they look at the data, they decide, has this worked? If it hasn't, they continue it and maybe add even more benefits. If it has, then they let other businesses come in. Um, the role of other non-social equity businesses, you're going to find a lot of different opinions on. Um, my personal opinion is that the government is the one that has caused the harms by the war on drugs and the resources to fix it and the one that works for the public. Um, so I think that it makes sense uh, for the government to be the one to fix the harms. Um, but uh, some states have a role for corporations. Um, I think probably one of the best ones is what they have in Oakland where you get a licensing benefit if you incubate a business by giving them part of your property. And that part is really important because property is probably after capital the most difficult uh, barrier for applicants. It's very difficult to find one that's zoned properly. Once you do, um, the rent is going to be 10 times higher than it would otherwise. And so um, if you're an applicant and you can get some benefits from the state and then you can get property from um, another business, I think that's a really good combination. And then finally, um, I think evaluation and adjustment is uh, something that can make and break your program, especially if you are clear with communication from the beginning. I think that's another thing we learned in Massachusetts is we set expectations really high, um, but people uh, felt that it didn't work you know, overnight, and then we think we lost some credibility at that point. So I wish we had said, this hasn't worked very well in other states. We couldn't get the time because we were the first, but you could say, you know, here's our plan. We're going to come back, you know, in this many months and listen to your challenges and, and change our regulations and just be clear about that from the beginning. That might be all of my slides. Yes, so happy to take your questions now. Uh, thank you, Shaleen. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I, one of the things that I, I mentioned to you before um, was about trust. So, you know, we're asking folks to come from a legacy market into a regulated market, and maybe they haven't had a great experience in the criminal justice system, or they've, you know, intentionally 
um, operating outside of, you know, a typical system. Um, and it sounds like there are some ways to build trust. Um, I wonder if the tour that you went on that you spoke about, it, was that an effort to build trust? Or are there other things that, you know, other commissions have done to build trust? That's such a good question. I'm really glad that's what you're thinking about right now. Um, we had both an official listening session and then kind of an unofficial tour. So the listening session was, of course, open to everybody. Um, and we took care to put it um, in the area that where the people we were trying to reach were. Um, and then we got yelled at rightfully because we did, we did it during the day, during work hours. Um, so it was like, okay, here's our first example of listening to you. We're going to hold another one. Or we're going to hold it at night. And then a lot more people came. And then um, we talked to the people who are already doing the work. Because I think if you are trying to make your own credibility, that's a lot more difficult than if you can connect with people who already have credibility. And you can show them, like the first time you meet them, they have no reason to trust you. Why should they? But if they say, here are some things you can implement, and then you do it and you go back to them, um, that trust is going to eventually filter to you. Great. Thank you. Um, Pepper, Kyle, Susanna, Nader, I'm not sure if you're still here. Are any questions? So let me just uh, jump in, if you don't mind. Um, Shalene, thank you so much for being here. I just wanted to introduce um, Susanna Davis is our state, the state of Vermont uh, racial equity director. And she um, has been charged in our enabling legislation to help us define social equity applicant and develop some social equity programs. So we've asked her to join us as kind of an honorary board member today, um, just so that she can tap into your knowledge as well. Um, and Nader um, Hashim is a um, former representative, former state police who you know, really has led the effort in the legislature on criminal justice reform in a lot of different ways. And he was recently appointed by the Speaker of the House to be our um, to our advisory committee in the capacity of a person with expertise in systemic social justice and equity issues. And so we also invited him here today because he'll be helping with this um, this piece of our work as well. Um, and I would like to thank you for being here so much. I'd like to put a plug in for your Social Equity 2.0 um, webinar series. You know, I look forward to those more than almost anything else that I listen to. And it really clued me into a few issues that I just was not aware of. And I'd like to ask you about, if you don't mind. Um, sure. um, so the one is related to the kind of community, co community host agreements and um, local control and how that impacts the ability to deliver on the social equity and economic empowerment uh, you know, promises that are in um, the legislation that we have, at least. And if I don't, if you don't mind me kind of piggybacking on that also, um, another issue that you um, kind of cued me into uh, in your conversations with, uh, in your first um, Social Equity 2.0 was around um, limiting predatory practices against social equity applicants um, and kind of these you know, lending agreements that maybe means that you're 51% owner, but oh, by the way, you know, you're actually, you know, taking loans from people that are, um, you know, amassing your profits, essentially. So if you could, wouldn't mind just speaking about those two issues, the kind of local control and the uh, kind of predatory lending practices, if you wouldn't mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and thank you for watching those sessions. You were absolutely the target audience. <laughs> I'm glad it was helpful. <laughs> Um, and I also wanted to say to uh, Susanna that I saw, um, or at least I read a live tweeted thread of her last presentation. I thought it was excellent and, and very much on point. So, um, so yeah, these are two big red flags, host community agreements and predatory practices. So host community agreements in Massachusetts were meant to be an agreement between a business and a community that would cover things like signage and um, hours of operation and what you know a local community should control and it would also allow the business to reimburse the city for any um, costs that came up uh, like uh, traffic studies or extra security on opening day but what happened was the cities ended up just charging whatever they wanted um, to the businesses and over time uh, it's very much been abused um, and it really prevented our, our equity program from succeeding so um, I thought a lot about this, and I think there are two ways you could go. 
Um, and one is the legislative route and trying to make sure that at the very least, um, municipalities have the same consistent equity mandate as at the state level. Um, and then also incentives on top of that. Maybe if it's something very small, like we have a 3% um, local tax, but if it was just uh, you know one more percent of the state tax, which is another 17, if that was shifted to municipalities for each dollar um, that comes in to an equity business in a town, I think that would be really helpful. And the reason I phrase it that way is because there are a hundred different barriers that take place that you can't predict until they actually open. And so once you get to that point where they actually open and you're getting the incentive at that point, now the municipalities have a reason to help versus you know you trying to legislate every one of those barriers. Um, that's one. But I know that everywhere, but especially in New England, you know it's it's very difficult to to legislate that that sort of balance. So instead, um, it would be so helpful if you just, um, to the extent you can, invest in providing guidance to the people who do want to help at the local level. And it might even be as simple as, you know, helping one city to do it right, you know, and then once they do it right, making sure that that model ordinance is available to everybody. Um, and, you know, nonprofits at the local level, advocacy groups, they can really be helpful, you know, as in getting people involved in the process. So if you can't reach the local officials, if you reach them through, you know, their constituents, I've seen that be really successful here. Um, but just thinking about it from the beginning, I think you're going to <laughs> ahead of the game. Um, and of course, we, we can share, um, you know, ordinances from Boston, Cambridge, Oakland, all of these places that have done it really well. So predatory practices, that's the other one. Um, you know, I think there's a difference between what's actually written right on the paper in terms of your regulations and then what's done in practice. And this was really key for us because we have that ownership limit, um, but we could have just taken it, you know, at the letter of the law and said, well, if you're not, you know, a written owner or a written, you know, controller of this company, then, you know, it's not a problem and just let it go. And if we had done that, I think that none of our equity businesses would have actually been run by the people, you know, who are purportedly running it. It took a lot of work um, to hire a contractor, an accounting firm to check the, uh, the contracts. And then also, um, this goes back to the trust that Julie was asking about, because you really need the businesses who are being approached with these practices to feel comfortable coming to you. And that's like, I think the, by far the way that we found out about this was the businesses would tell us, hey, this other company approached me and they offered me this. Um, and sometimes, you know, they're real slick about it. They'll like say, I won't talk to you unless we sign an NDA. And these companies really need capital, right? So they're incentivized to be part of this. They're not incentivized necessarily to come and tell, you know, the government about it. But if you create that trust and you're very clear that you are going to enforce this and, you know, you have to be the company that is um, actually running the company, um, that's clear. And then the one very important thing I, I will close with on that is you have to think about which party is going to be the one to face the consequences if this does happen. And if, it if it's just that the smaller company loses their license, that's not really fair. Um, so I would think about writing into your regulations that if you are a bigger company and you approach a smaller company with something that is attempting to circumvent, um, you know, the eligi eligibility requirements for the equity program, then you would face penalties for that. Um, and we have a lot of language written on that that took years of refining that we can share with you. Thank you. Hi, Shaleen. Kyle here is here. It's it's great to meet you. And as as James alluded to earlier, I'm a big fan of. <laughs> A lot of your work. I'm glad that you just mentioned consequences for this predatory atmosphere and who's actually responsible, because that's something that I'm continuously thinking about. Um, I, I was, you got my brain spinning in a good way when I looked at your, you described your multi-tiered equity program. I think that's really, really cool, and I'm interested to kind of dig in more uh, to that and figuring out how we can right-size something like that. Um, 
for a state up here to help businesses or entrepreneurs or individual um, interested folks, um, you know, depending on where they're at and, and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, I had a, a question, and, and I, I recognize you worked for um, the state and, and not cities or municipalities in Massachusetts, but but Boston setting aside, I think you said 50% licenses for social equity applicants. I, and you might not be at liberty to know too much about how they got to that number or um, the legal risk that, that Boston may be willing to take on. And we heard from Bo Kilmer and we, we know that there's jurisdictions that, you know, are more hesitant than others on how they, what words they use, describe things, so on and so forth. Uh, my, my only, and I'm, I'm not necessarily overly cautious. I want, I want this to be a big part of what we're doing, but I also don't want to advise, I'll call them municipalities in Vermont and not necessarily cities based on our size, um, to go ahead and, and pursue some type of localized program like that, uh, recognizing that it could open up a can of legal worms that, that they might not be equipped to really respond to in a way that will keep the integrity of, of what they're trying to do at a local level. Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, I can definitely speak to that because we spent a lot of time um, both at the state level and then helping out cities. So I think that um, what you don't, what would be the most legally risky is if you have a specific licensing quota based on race, which is what Ohio did. Um, granted, at that time, we didn't have data on the industry, and now you have data on the industry, so I think it's a lot less risky now than it was back then, but it's still the most risky option. Um, what we did was uh, for our economic empowerment program, which is, is very similar to the equity program, we came up with six criteria, and one of them is Black and Latino descent specifically. And that was based on well-documented data that every state has that shows that the war on drugs has been disproportionately um, waged against those communities. But the other criteria were things like um, residency, arrests and who you hired. So you could qualify in a variety of ways. And I think that's really the key question is, can you still qualify if you are not black or Latino? And I think that helps um, lower your risk. The other thing that helps lower your risk is if you have a lot of um, evidence that this was based on data. So we, um, we commissioned a report um, and then we just now after several years, they commissioned another report. We had a lot of discussion about it in public. So if anyone um, questions, you know, how we came up with those, those areas or those races, you know, they'll be able to do it. In some places, it's indigenous populations as well, depending on, on what it looks like. Um, the other thing I want to note is that in Cambridge, they only allowed economic empowerment applicants for the first two years. Um, and medical operators in the state did sue, um, and it was eventually dropped after a, a backlash. But before it was dropped, um, there was a motion for summary judgment that was denied, and it did suggest that the state's program was going to be held up because it, it was not a race quota. So I think it's important to... Um, I'll just quickly recap. So you should be able to qualify in ways other than race. It should be well documented. That's it. Thank you so much. I have more if, uh, but Susanna Nodder. I don't, and I, I'm actually, I have to jump because um, I'm late for a different board meeting, but I just wanted to say, Shalene, thank you so much. This has been really, really ex insightful, um, insi insightful. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you to the board for, for inviting me. Reach out to me anytime that can be helpful. I just wanted to also say thanks. And some of my thoughts were mostly swirling around the predatory practices, which, which has been discussed at length. So I don't want to uh, beat a dead horse or anything like that, but thank you. Sure, I, I can add one more thing on that. Um, we found, when I was talking to regulators in other places, 
Um, we found that people were trying the exact same approaches here in California, Illinois, um, that I would have otherwise never known about if the regulators in those places hadn't told me. So it's good to, to be in contact about that too. So I, I had a, a question, just um, our legislation um, kind of demands that we move very quickly. Uh, and, you know, we were supposed to kind of be sad on a specific day and then within four weeks have an executive director and then within two months have the whole structure of the market figured out and then, you know, go through a flawless rulemaking process, you know, all kind of trying to go to a specific date where we had to open kind of our retail stores. Um, we are behind schedule um, uh, pretty significantly. And I'm just wondering, you know, I know Massachusetts was behind schedule a little bit as well. And I'm wondering how these sort of aggressive deadlines that um, are kind of expected of the board. I know, you know, you had a ballot initiative, which kind of set the date where you all were supposed to get going. But um, how do these ag aggressive deadlines impact social equity applicants and our ability to kind of deliver on these social equity um, kind of undergirdings of our of our statute? Without question, those are opposing forces because the faster you go, the more you need to default to systemic things already in place that already favor big corporations and do not favor equity businesses. Um, so anything that you can do to make sure that it's the equity businesses that open first, even if that takes longer, uh, is really going to help. And um, I know at the time, it is not you. Um, the, the legislation that they, windows that they put out are just totally unrealistic. And I know at the time I was trying to balance those forces. If I could go back, I would have said, it's a matter of a few months and it is a matter of future generations that are counting on us, just like with alcohol prohibition. So, you know, everybody can just calm down for a few months. I, I wish I had said that more. Yeah, yeah that's, that. I'm, you know, I, we don't have a general counsel yet. We don't have an executive director yet. I'm trying to, um, you know, use my, whatever platform I have right now to hopefully tr try and reset expectations and kind of get people to realize that, you know, it's not, if, if this legislation calls for us to prioritize social equity applicants and to provide um, services for them, we got to make sure those services are available um, and that uh, we can actually deliver on some of that um, and not just focus so squarely on the deadlines that are in our legislation. Right. This is more of a messaging thing than a policy thing, but I often found that um, in the public discussion, the the business profits and the rights of consumers would get conflated and people would act like if the stores weren't open you know people were still being arrested and that's that's not the case you know like stopping arrest is an immediate need um but businesses making money is is not yeah you know i think it also somewhat ties into the the, the piece that you did about sequential licensing and maybe you weren't talking about this but offering you know making sure that people that are cultivating um, have a place to process and test and then, you know, a retail operation and making sure that, you know, we're aware of the grow cycle versus how long it takes to actually set up a retail operation and how long, you know, the testing is going to take and, and whether we have the capacity to even test. You know, I'm making a note to add that <laughs> to when I talk about the sequential licensing, because I think we kind of dropped the ball on that. I think mean, that's a really important point. Yeah, thank you. Yep. It makes Nat us nervous a little bit. Yep. Yeah. I think Natter has a question. Thank you. Um, one one thought just popped into my head, um, kind of onto a different track um, regarding arrests after um, commercialization. I was wondering if you found that people who were using marijuana, I, I don't know if you have these this data in front of you, but if people who were using cannabis were still finding themselves uh, being arrested or investigated um, for other for for other issues um, that so I'm, I'm trying to find out how to phrase this the best way but people who were using cannabis getting investigated because they were using cannabis even though it was legal at the time and being investigated for other crimes sorry if I didn't articulate that very well but if that makes any sense 
No, you articulated that perfectly well. Um, yeah, I don't have the, the data in front of me, but I can tell you from my, my, my personal knowledge and memory because we did have we do have a race research department um, that under our statute had to research these issues and do reports and present them to the commission and the public. So um, I would say no for that part and not because of um, us or the law, but because we have in my opinion, excellent Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts that does not allow things like um, the odor of marijuana to be used um, for arrest. And so, and of course, after legalization, you know, possession, possession and arrest went down, you couldn't profile people that way. Um, and, I, and I don't know any way that that continued. But what we did see was um, in terms of trafficking, distribution, um, the disparities either stayed the same or they got worse. Um, and, you know, police training did not fix that and legalization did not fix that. So I, I would say that, um, you know, it, it didn't fix the profiling, but it, it, it did stop the arrests and anything that would be based on possession or consumption arrests. So did I, did I hear that um, the kind of, enforcement of the illicit market to kind of distribute the distribution and the um, trafficking increased in Massachusetts following kind of the opening of retail stores? No? No, okay. no. The the disparities, the racial disparities okay. did. So it was still disproportionately Black and Latino people who were being arrested for that and maybe at a higher rate. Okay. Um, and that, that reports on the, the commission website. Um, as far as enforcement of the illicit market, there was actually um, a concerted lobbying effort by the legal dispensaries to crack down on the illicit market. Um, and I think the general consensus was that that was absolutely premature. Um, and that was really unfair to legacy operators that did not have a pathway to the legal market yet. And once you create that pathway, then you can start thinking about enforcement. Other questions? I have so much to think about right now. <laughs> Any other questions from um, our group? No, I mean, is, is it, I know you offered Susanna, but I mean, are, are you available as a resource kind of offline if, if things come up? Yeah. There's nothing better I could do with my time, honestly, that I could think of. So absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, thank think. you. For, for, for that offer, I think after all our presentations, but especially hearing from you and Bo, I, uh, my head is swimming with ideas that I hope are good ones, but, but you know, <laughs> recognizing that people have probably had those ideas in other states and some have been great and some have not worked out as, as envisioned, so. Well, I will leave you with this. Um, first, you might want to go to the Mass Cannabis Control um, Commission website and just browse through those reports. They're like hundreds of pages long, but they'll they'll spark these ideas. And then the second thing is do not be afraid to innovate and experiment because, I mean, a lot of this stuff, you know, Colorado 10 years ago said six plants, so we said six plants, but it's a completely arbitrary number, right? So someone just made things up, so you should feel free to make things up too. <laughs> See how it goes. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Pepper, I'll turn it back to you. I think the last thing on our agenda is public comment, unless there's something else that we should discuss. Um, no, I mean, again, it's uh, incredible to have those resources, all of our witnesses today. Thank you, Julie, for taking the lead on putting that group together. Um, we will be uh, meeting next week uh, on Thursday. We will likely, very likely, uh, have a physical location somewhere uh, in Montpelier, um, potentially at our office building, um, if we have access by then. And, um, but we'll keep folks posted. And um, if anyone, again, wants to receive updates about the board's work, uh, we do have an online portal where you can kind of submit your email address and we'll we'll make sure that we communicate with you about any um, you know information that comes up. Uh, Nader, thanks for joining us. Um, feel free to stick around for public comment. Um, and it's really great to have you um, helping us out. And I've you know I, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about yourself. I hate to put you on the spot, but um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for for you and the work you've done both as a 
state trooper and in the legislature. Oh, thank you, James. Um, yeah, you know, I, I came into this position pretty quickly. I, I think I was appointed officially yesterday. Um, you know, my I'll, I'll just briefly describe my background. Um, you know, I was a state trooper for seven and a half years. I was a drug recognition expert during that time. And, you know, partway through my career, I, my, I started really seeing the impact of the war on drugs on people and um, started seeing how those disparities were playing out. Uh, and that led me into a different direction, which uh, got me into the legislature. Uh, where I served on the Judiciary Committee, and now I'm working as a paralegal, halfway toward halfway to becoming a lawyer, but working as a paralegal right now at a law firm in Brattleboro. And you know, I'm just really excited to be back at the table. And yeah, I, I, I look forward to this work. Unfortunately, I do have to hop off and go back to my other job, but um, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here for a little while at least. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much for joining us. Thank you so much for joining us, and I look Absolutely. forward to hearing from you. So um, I think unless um, Kyle or Julia have anything left to add, I think we will go to public comment, um, and that will be our last agenda item for the day. So again, if uh, you have a comment, we're going to start with the folks that joined through the link um, and can raise their virtual hands. And then we'll move to the folks on the phone after after that. And I know that we kind of had to bump a few people uh, last time. Um, so I'll start uh, with you, David. Hello again. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, two uh, social groups that deserve to be part of this equity conversation uh, that weren't brought up. Um, the first one uh, being in the Northeast Kingdom um, is the rural equity issue. And uh, however amazing uh, the presenters uh, and their testimony has been, um, there were a few things that did not acknowledge um, the importance of this market in terms of keeping money in the community. For example, when Bo Kilmer was talking about uh, limiting the initial licensing for retail operations, I would imagine if you were only going to issue out, say, half a dozen licenses to begin with, uh, the Northeast Kingdom wouldn't get one because disproportionately we are a, a very small population um, uh, considering you know, the state. Uh, there are already people here who are, who are planning on opening stores or are hoping to get a license, um, you know, but we're what, 45,000 people. So um, I would really hope that this marketplace from the cultivation standpoint and the retail standpoint, um, if, if the money can circulate within the region, right? So the growers, the cultivators in the Northeast Kingdom can sell to uh, retail operations in the Northeast Kingdom and that money stay in the Northeast Kingdom rather than going off to Montpelier or um, you know Burlington area. Um, it would be really unfortunate to see a, a, you know a bunch of our residents have to drive out there and spend their money. I think also um, most of them wouldn't drive out there to spend their money. They would spend their money in the black market. And I think part of what we're trying to do here is prevent that from happening. Um, I, I also want to bring up another um, uh, demographic group that, that has not been recognized at all in this. Um, and I'm not exactly sure if they can be the same way that people of color um, and some of the more impacted groups uh, can be acknowledged um, as, as priorities. But, um, you know, we're, we're, we're 50 years uh, since the commencement of the war on drugs, but we're also this year, just in a few months, 30 years from the first legal retail cannabis outlet in the United States. Uh, that, that was the Cannabis Buyers Club in San Francisco, which opened in 1991 uh, due to uh, San Francisco's Proposition P. Um, it was uh, voted with 80% uh, support. Uh, Dennis Perone, um, a gay man, um, opened up the club with the intent of uh, supplying people dying of AIDS. Um, 
with with the ability to die with dignity. Um, and so, you know, the LGBTQ community has been at the forefront of of this. They are the pioneers of this. And um, I don't know if there's a way that that can be acknowledged in this legislation. Um, but um, I think it needs to be said. Uh, there were a few other things here that that concerned me. Um, Erica, um, who spoke it, and I don't mean to just call her by her first name. I, I just don't know her last name. Uh, but she mentioned cannabis as being a, a hallucinogen. Uh, that's a dated term. Um, cannabis is not a hallucinogen. Um, it is a powerful medicine. It is a powerful drug. However, comparing uh, the sale of cannabis to uh, that of a pharmacy, I think is uh, a, a real error. Um, you know, pharmacies offer thousands of, of drugs, tens of thousands of drugs. Um, we're only talking about one. I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, emphasize my opinion here that a uh, retail operation is going to be not too far from that of a liquor store or a bar. Um, and uh, her comment about um, um, prioritizing people who are, who are entrenched in the community, who are invested in the community, I want to point out that that is a privilege. It's a privilege to be invested in the community. Uh, people who have time and money can afford to be invested in the community. We're trying to give an opportunity to people who would otherwise not have the time and income to be invested in the community, an opportunity to be invested. So, um, and then the idea of keeping out um, out of state people who are people of color, people with prior convictions. We want to attract a lot of this energy to our state. We want this state to grow. We want taxpayers here. We want to, we want these laws to attract not only tourists, but people who are um, uh, going to invest in this as an industry. Um, and the best way to do that is to open up these priority groups, not only to people in, in state, but, but people who are willing to come here, to move here, to bring their money, to bring their knowledge, and to bring their, um, their, their, their demographic, their diversity, right? Um, yep. I think Thanks. That's thank you, David. Yep, thank you very much for that. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Graham? Thank you. I recognize I already spoke, um, and I will do my best to, to limit my comments. Uh, I want to thank Shailene and, and Bo for, for their time and their expertise here today. Um, and I was, I think you know, most of my responses at this point are to some of the things that Bo um, said. You know, he spoke to sort of a bipolarity of profit maximization in the industry versus government stores. And I think that there's some middle ground uh, there. And I think that's in the scale appropriate regulations that we've articulated. He spoke to limiting the number of licenses, and I think that's one way of addressing um, production, but you can also limit the scale of licenses. So in our recommendations, which you know or you've seen, we, limit a, we recommend a craft scale of licensure. And if you want, if you're concerned about overproduction, you could start with the craft scale of licensure. There's craft retailers, there's craft deliveries, and we would recommend that there be no limits on the number of those licenses. Um, there's a limit on scale. And those retailers can only buy from craft producers. And that would be one way of limiting the possibility of overproduction and equitably distributing to the smallest scale of folks, which is also the most accessible scale of license. Uh, I was also really surprised that um, zoning wasn't spoken to by either of the guests as a barrier. But I did catch that Shailene mentioned that um, one of the main barriers was zoning and that, it, um, that in fact, the cost of property that was uh, uh, properly zoned for cannabis production went up substantially. Um, so I think that's one of the potential unintended consequences here is by saying you can't have this in agricultural lands or in residential areas, you are encouraging development in commercial areas where you could otherwise have a plant going in the ground. And I think one of the most accessible, someone also spoke to the low cost of delivery licenses. It's also extremely low cost to just put plants in the ground. You don't need to build a warehouse. You can have a small license and just put plants in the ground. And I think we're ignoring that. I'd love to hear their comments on a lot of the scale appropriate regulations we have put forth, differentiating between indoor and outdoor. Um, testing wasn't mentioned, and I know all the growers we've spoken to have mentioned testing as a, as a point, a, entry, a barrier to entry. Um, 
he mentioned uh, increased enforcements could help equity licenses potentially. And I think that really is making some assumptions about who constitutes the legacy, legacy market and not acknowledging the in inequity of their positionality and the goal of bringing them in right away. Shailene spoke well to this to some extent. Um, but I think, you know, one of the issues we're already facing is that these people are feeling like they're being treated as criminals. They're not comfortable necessarily coming to talk to you. They're not comfortable necessarily coming to talk to the legislature and they're sort of being treated that way still and have that stigma attached to them. Um, he talked about employment reduction uh, as a potential result of legalization. And I think um, he also mentioned like legal large licenses and efficiency. And I think that really, again, speaks to the importance of small licenses in businesses in a number of licenses as opposed to the scale. Um, uh, we can't control federal legalization, but we can certainly provide an equitable and scale appropriate model and encourage supply management. You know, in agriculture, we see these models in Canada and other parts of the world that try to bring more equity to markets. We can set an example here in Vermont of what a national market could look like, and we can position people in the small business side um, to be prepared. Um, we've already talked about Appalachians a little bit with you, and I you know in the uh, in our conversations with the head of the Humboldt Growers Alliance, they talked about them looking towards that as a way of um, achieving some equity for for folks uh, going forward at the small scale. Um, I'm also, for example, I'm a small beef producer in one of the most concentrated sectors of the U.S. food economy. I am able to make even uh, able to participate in that because I have access to direct sales. Um, and if this were an agriculturally uh, designated crop for outdoor production, those people would also have access to direct sales. Um, you could certainly limit what that would look like, et cetera. Um, he mentioned using revenue to address inequity outside of access to the industry. Shailene did too, and I really think that's a place where you all can act. The legislature chose not to and sort of dismissed that idea, but I think it's really critical. Um, and I am I am a Vermont, I grew up in Vermont, and I absolutely do not support, you know, prioritizing people who have lived here for a certain period of time. I think, as was said by the last speaker, um, giving people, regardless of where they're from, opportunity to engage in this industry equitably with others is is really critical. Um, and I'll leave time for others to speak there. Great. Th thank you, Graham. And I know that, you know, like all of your public comments, you're giving us some big ideas to think about. Um, and uh, we do intend to kind of engage in a much more granular level on some of the ideas that are being brought before us over these um, set of initial meetings um, once we have our stakeholder process or you know state advisory committee and we have a executive director and consultant in place so we can really start to do the work of the board um, is there anyone else um, um, that joined via the link that would like to provide public comment and if you could just raise your virtual hand if so We have um, one person, uh, it looks like, who's joined by phone. Um, if you would like to provide public comment, um, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six. Okay. Well, thank you um, again, Julie. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you to all of our presenters. It's been um, an incredibly powerful day in, in my in my impression. Um, we've learned a lot today. Um, next week, uh, we'll probably be meeting same time, um, Thursday, uh, roughly nine to two. And um, there aren't any further comments from the board. Um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, I'll move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, um, Nelly, could you please uh, stop the recording and um, sign off when you're ready?